Welcome to Windows 95 TrainCast, the program designed to prepare you for the move to and implementation of Microsoft's Windows 95. Windows 95 TrainCast is sponsored in part by Dell Computer Corporation. Be watching today to find out how you can win a full multimedia Dell computer system simply by viewing our program. Our host for today's show is well known in the computer training profession. Elliot Maisie is president of the Maisie Center. He has authored 12 books, including the popular Computer Training Handbook by Lakewood Publications. Now live from the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington, Elliot Maisie. Hello, I'm Elliot Maisie, and it's great to be back here in Redmond. Welcome to Windows 95 and Remote Connectivity, the sixth program in the Windows 95 Traincast series focused on preparing information system and support professionals for migration to and support of Windows 95. As you know, Windows 95 is the next major release of the Windows operating system designed for desktop and portable PCs. For those of you who have been following this series, you know that we've already addressed such important issues as cost of migration, setup and installation, networking, and networking and netware. The TrainCast series consists of the most up-to-date minute information on Windows 95. Like our previous programs, we have with us today a Microsoft Worldwide Trainer and a Windows 95 product manager to answer your questions and demonstrate the intricacies of the Windows 95 operating system. Windows 95 is an integrated and complete operating system. Some of the features provided by Windows 95 include a more intuitive way to work, an easier and exciting new user interface, and as you will see in today's show, an on-ramp onto the information superhighway. As a computer training specialist, I have watched as new hardware form factors emerge that allow office professionals to compute in various locations. These new road warriors of American business are taking more control and becoming less dependent and bound to one central location. Consultants, CEOs, and sales professionals are using their laptops and notebooks while traveling, maintaining contact with their office and their customers via electronic mail, phone, and fax, while staying one step ahead of the competition and providing better service. Windows 95 is the first operating system to specifically address the needs of mobile computing. As you will see today, Windows 95 will facilitate the coordination of data from different sources as it makes it easier to compute in different locations. Before we get started, let's briefly review all the information-rich tools available in addition to this broadcast. It is critical for the IS and support professional to become totally familiar with this new technology and to provide leadership to their business organizations and end users as we move to the next era of computing with Windows 95. There are numerous materials provided by Microsoft and third-party vendors to prepare you for the release of Windows 95. The details of where and how you can get them will be shown later in the show. Also. I would like to ask those of you who received the TrainCast fax back review form to please assist us in making TrainCast the best show it can be by filling out the form and faxing it back to us at Microsoft TV. Your comments help us to better meet your needs with our programming. This series of TrainCast broadcasts is a great first step in your preparation to migrate to Windows 95. Here is a list of printed and online resources to supplement what you will learn today. First and foremost, the Windows 95 Reviewer's Guide details information about the Windows 95 features and functionality. WinNews is an electronic newsletter that details the current status of Windows 95 and provides information about upcoming events as Windows 95 nears completion. The Gardner Group report is a financial study on the cost of migrating to Windows 95 and the eventual savings to your organization. The Windows 95 Resource Kit is an exclusive Microsoft collection providing complete technical information and tools to help IS professionals and Windows enthusiasts become experts on Windows 95. This Microsoft Project Template gives you a head start in setting up your deployment plans for Windows 95. The template consists of a starter schedule of typical deployment tasks and specifically formatted views tailored for the Windows 95 deployment effort. Inside Windows 95 by A.G. and King is the first book to fully document the internals of the next generation of Windows. The TrainCast series and other Microsoft TV broadcasts 
as you know, offer accessible, up-to-the-minute information on many Microsoft products. In fact, we want you to utilize the information from these programs as much as possible and encourage you to record our programs and rebroadcast them. The times that our programming airs may not always be convenient for everyone in your organization. Why not make a learning event of it? Pop popcorn and gather around the big screen. We get many questions about whether or not you can record our programs. Please feel free. Here's a list of the restrictions. Now, there are very few, as long as you don't cut or edit me out. Microsoft Authorized Technical Education Centers provide certified training courses on Windows 95. Many of these education centers are hosting today's show. Microsoft's TechNet is a set of two CD-ROMs published every month containing the most up-to-date information available on all Microsoft's products and operating systems. You can bet there's plenty of information on Windows 95 as it nears release. Finally, the Maisie Center offers two products to further your education. By subscribing to Windows 95 at Maisie.com on the internet, you will receive an ongoing set of information, resources, and tips on a variety of Windows 95 training and learning strategies. And Briefingware for Windows 95 is a briefing in the box to keep corporate end users and management up to date on learning events surrounding Windows 95. Now today's show is scheduled to run for four hours. We're happy to have Ben Stewart here today, a worldwide trainer for Microsoft. Ben will be covering four areas of mobile connectivity today. The first segment will cover various new features of Windows 95, specifically designed to enhance mobile computing. The second segment will cover connectivity through the Windows 95 dial-up networking client. In the third segment, Ben will discuss the dial-up server available in Microsoft Plus and the difference between point-to-point -point and point-to-LAN connections. The final segment will be on Microsoft Exchange. Included in today's program is a special presentation on the anxiously awaited Microsoft Plus, presented by Alex Saunders. Alec is a Windows 95 product manager with a focus on Microsoft Plus. Microsoft Plus is a separate product designed specifically for Windows 95 and will be shipping in the same time frame as Windows 95. Alec will show us some of the features, including the Microsoft Plus Internet Jumpstart Kit. We also have Mary Haggard joining us today for another round of TechNet Tips. Following each of these sections, we will take a few minutes to answer your questions. Microsoft has a team of Windows 95 engineers standing by right now to answer your questions. So feel free to call any time during the show. The number is 206-635-7066. And some of your questions will be selected to be answered live on the air. Now, one more thing before Ben gets started. We're continuing our giveaway contest to the end of the TrainCast series. Now, there are only two shows left. This is your chance to win a complete multimedia computer system provided by the Dell Corporation. It is so easy to win. Here's what you do. I'm going to ask you a simple question pertaining to the content of today's show. A hundred names will be drawn from the correct answers to today's question. Winners will receive a free copy of Microsoft Encarta. Everyone that calls in will have their name entered into a grand prize drawing for a chance to win the Dell Multimedia Computer System. The winner of this system will be announced at the end of our last show in August, so mark it on your calendar. You must be watching in order to win. Now here's today's question. Name the feature of Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines or servers. When you know the answer, call 1-800-254-4069. Please be sure and leave your name, address, and phone number when you call in. Now, let's talk mobile computing in Windows 95. When customers were, sur were surveyed, they identified three major challenges of mobile computing. Keeping organized, getting the most out of portable PC hardware, and staying in touch. The nature of the mobile work environment introduces significant time-consuming organizational challenges. For example, mobile users can spend inordinate amounts of time making sure that files stay in sync between a portable PC and a desktop PC or file server. Likewise, few good methods exist today for managing print jobs created out of the office. Ben has some great news on both of these fronts, along with other features of Windows 95 that will make your mobile computing experience positive and productive. Ben? Thank you, Elliot. Today's computing environment is radically different than even a few years ago. 
Smaller hardware form factors, including PCMCIA cards, notebooks, docking stations, and advancement in communication software have given rise to a new type of mobile computing professional. To meet the needs of this expanding segment of the market, Windows 95 has built an extensive support for mobile computing, including connectivity to online services and to the internet. Today's program will cover four basic areas of mobile computing and also give some insights to the mobile feature set of another product called Microsoft Plus. For those of you who have not heard of Microsoft Plus, Microsoft Plus is a product that will ship in the same time frame as Windows 95 and includes expanded features for Windows 95. The features include a system agent, compression enhancement, internet features, a game, and the ability to customize the look and feel of the graphical user interface. However, today we will concern ourselves solely with Microsoft Plus's web browser and the Internet Setup Wizard. So here are the four mobile segments. In segment one, I'll show you some new features of Windows 95 specifically designed to enhance mobile computing. These include protected mode PCMCIA support, hardware profiles, TAPI, the briefcase, deferred printing, and advanced power management. Windows 95 provides full 32-bit protected mode support for both the PCMCI adapter and the PCMCI socket, as well as supporting dynamic configuration of changes in the system hardware. In segment two, I'll demonstrate connectivity through the Windows 95 dial-up networking client, including the difference between data and line protocols. I will cover what line protocols will be available for Windows 95, PPP, RAS, SLIP, and Network Connect, and how you can connect to the internet. In segment three, I'll discuss the dial-up server available in Microsoft Plus, and I'll explain what the difference is between a point-to-point -point versus a point-to-land connection. Other topics include the NetBIOS gateway and IPX router, and what security options the dial-up server provides from unauthorized callers. The dial-up server now provides point-to-land connectivity, as opposed to the point-to-point -point connectivity that was available in Windows for Workgroup's 311 RAS dial-up server. This means now, when you dial into a Windows 95 dial-up server, you will have connectivity to nearly all the shared resources on your LAN. Lastly, in segment four, Microsoft Exchange, I'll discuss the different mail clients and describe how to set up the Microsoft Mail client to download mail from a remote post office. Demonstrations will cover how to set up Microsoft Exchange to download CompuServe and Internet Mail and send in and receiving faxes. We'll also take a peek at Microsoft Network, the Microsoft online service, and what mail services it will provide. At this point, let me take the opportunity to introduce the computers I'll be using during the show. My primary machine is a Dell Latitude XP46 portable running Windows 95. My second computer is a portable 486 running Windows. I also have a docking station that has an HP LaserJet 4L plug and play printer attached to it. My other two machines are a Dell Optiplex XL 75 megahertz Pentium running Windows 95 and I also have a Dell Optiplex XL 90 megahertz Pentium running NetWare version 3.12. Our first section is protected mode PCMCIA support. PCMCIA, which stands for Personal Computer Memory Card International Association, is a set of rules for creating credit card size adapters such as network interface cards and fax modems. PCMCIA devices have been around for years, primarily in the mobile computing area. Until now, PCMCIA users have been forced to use real mode drivers, which can be hard to configure and take up large amounts of conventional memory. Windows 95 is going to provide full 32-bit protected mode support for PCMCA devices. To enable the protected mode support, Windows 95 provides a PCMCIA installation wizard. The wizard is normally located in the control panel, PCMCIA. If the PCMCIA icon does not exist, you can add it by installing support for your PCMCIA socket through control panel, add new hardware. Let's take this opportunity to walk through the PCMCI installation wizard now. 
Since I'll be using control panel so much throughout this demonstration, I'll start by creating a shortcut to control panel on my desktop. To do this, I'll start my computer, then I'll secondary click on control panel, and then drag it to my desktop. When I let go, I have the option to create the shortcut here. This will make it simple for me whenever I need to, to start control panel, I can just double click on it on my desktop. To start the PCMCI wizard, double click on control panel, then choose PC card PCMCIA. This starts the PCMCI installation wizard. The first screen is asking me if I'm using my PCMCI socket to load Windows. For example, if I was using a PCMCI network interface card and installing Windows 95 off of the network. Since I'm not, I'll select No and then select Next. The next screen is telling me that Windows 95 did not find any real mode drivers on my system. Windows 95 can detect many real mode drivers and remove them for you. I now have the opportunity to look at all of my configuration files and make sure those are gone. So I'll walk through, I can see my config.sys, my autoexec.bat, and my system.ini. Since I don't have any real mode drivers loading, I'll select next. Now I'm finished. That's all I have to do to set up PCMCA support under Windows 95. This does require boot, and it will require your computer to actually be turned off and then turned back on. Now I'll power back on the laptop. For more information on what PCMCA drivers Windows 95 knows about, look in your PCMCIA.inf file located in your Windows slash INF directory. An important thing to note is all real mode PCMCIA drivers must be disabled to use the protected mode PCMCIA drivers in Windows 95. After this is complete, your system will require a reboot. Next, to show you the advantages of using protected mode PCMCA drivers, I'll go into the control panel, then choose the system icon. Next I'll click on device manager. Notice that I don't have a modem installed. Now watch what happens when I insert this PCMCIA fax modem into my portable. Notice Windows 95 has found a new piece of hardware and is installing drivers for it. You also heard a beep. What that beep was is notifying us that a PCMCA device has been inserted into the laptop. From now on, whenever I insert this device, I will only hear the beep. Now you can see through Device Manager that I have a modem. Absolutely no need to restart the system. All of the drivers I need are loaded dynamically. Windows 95 supplies PCMCA socket drivers for Databook and Intel sockets. If your socket is not one of those two or 100% compatible, you'll need to load the real mode drivers that came with your system. Windows 95 does not support mixing real mode and protected mode drivers when it comes to PCMCA devices. It's either all real mode or all protected mode. The next thing I'd like to talk about is hardware profiles. Using Windows 3.1 on a portable computer that needed multiple hardware configurations could be a bit of a challenge. For example, when a laptop is undocked, the video display usually requires a lower resolution and color depth than when it is docked. The display resolution will need to change to support the larger monitor when the portable is attached to the docking station. With Windows 3.1, the only way to accomplish this was to keep multiple INI files and batch files to switch between the two. Windows 95 takes care of this problem by introducing hardware profiles. Hardware profiles allow you to maintain different hardware configurations on one computer. For example, a docked and undocked configuration 
that will make it easy to change hardware configurations such as your video, your mouse, and your keyboard. Let's take a look at hardware profiles in action. Windows 95 was set up on this laptop when it was undocked. I will now take this laptop, insert it into the docking station, and turn it on. Windows 95 has now detected that this is the first time I've booted this computer in this docking station and has started to build a new hardware profile for it. What's taking place now is Windows 95 is running detection to find all the other devices that are attached to this docking station. This process may take a few minutes. Now that this process is complete, Windows 95 has created a new hardware profile called Dock 1. I'll select Enter. And now Windows 95 is going to require that the computer is restarted. After restarting the computer, I will now have two hardware profiles, one for docked and one for undocked. To check, start control panel, then select the system icon. Next choose hardware profiles. As you can see, I have two hardware profiles, dock one and undocked. The way a profile works is when a profile is selected, either automatically or manually, Windows 95 will only load hardware device drivers that are associated with that profile. To see this in action, select the Device Manager tab, then choose Monitor. As you can see, we, here we have our Dell Super VGA Monitor. When I click on it and choose Properties, I can see under Device Usage my two hardware profiles, Undocked and Docked 1. I can also see that this driver is only associated with the Dock 1 hardware configuration, which, by the way, is also showing me that this is the current configuration that I'm in. We'll select OK here, and then OK to close the system properties. Now let's shut down the computer and reboot it outside the docking station. Now I'll undock the portable from the docking station. Now I'm going to power on this portable computer outside of the docking station. Now that the portable is rebooted, notice that I didn't get any error messages as the machine came back up. Windows 95 automatically detected that I needed the undocked hardware profile. It switched and loaded my drivers for my smaller keyboard, my smaller display, and my smaller mouse automatically. If your BIOS provides the support, Windows 95 can detect that you're in a docked or undocked state and will load the appropriate hardware profile dynamically. If Windows 95 does not detect that you need multiple hardware profiles, you can create your own and make your selection every time you boot. To create your own hardware profiles, simply go into Control Panel, double click on the system icon, and then click on Hardware Profiles. To add a new hardware profile, select Copy, 
and then type in the name of the profile you want to create. In this example, I'll type in no net card. Now I have a new hardware profile. To put the profile to use, we'll go to the Device Manager tab, select a device, in this case I'll select the network adapter, click on my network adapter, choose Properties, and here I can see under Device Usage, I have all of my hardware profiles, including the no net card hardware profile that I just created. To disable this device for this hardware profile, I simply remove the check mark, then choose OK, and then close. And that's all there is to it. For those of you who use MS-DOS multiconfig, so you can have the option to load different configurations every time you boot, we'll be glad to know that you can link hardware profiles to your multiconfig menu options. For example, let's say you have a multi-config which gives you a menu option to not load any real mode network drivers. You have this option because you have a game, uh, I mean you have a very important application that requires a large amount of conventional memory. To link your multi-config to your hardware profile, open your config sys by selecting start, run, and then type in sysedit, then press enter. This will load the System Configuration Editor, which will allow you to easily edit any of your configuration files. We'll select the Config Sys. Now all we need to do is make a menu item for our new hardware profile. which is no net card. Okay. Then we also need to add a section for no net card. The next time you boot, Windows 95 will prompt me for which hardware profile I want to load, but will not prompt me for which multi-config option I need to load. Pretty cool. Another feature of Windows 95 that supports remote connectivity is the briefcase. This feature will allow you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machine or servers. The synchronization engine of the briefcase checks file dates and sizes and will allow you to update in either direction any files between the briefcase and the source directory. For example, how many times have you been working on a file between home and the office? Then all of a sudden you realize you have several different copies of the file and can't remember which one has the latest changes. The briefcase solves this problem. By keeping the files you work on the most in your briefcase, you no longer need to worry about misplacing those important files or winding up with duplicate copies. Let's take a look at how the briefcase works. To use the briefcase, simply drag files from a directory on your hard drive or from a shared folder on a network server to the briefcase icon on your desktop. In this example, I'll open up my computer, select my C drive, and then open up a directory. Now I can select a file that I want to take with me on the road. I'll click on it, and then while holding down my primary mouse button, drag it down to the briefcase and drop it in. Now when I'm on the road, I can double click my briefcase, and then to edit the file, I simply double click on the file which will launch the application this file was created in. Now I can make any changes I want to to the file. Okay, Save the file as I normally would, and then close down the application. When you've finished working on the files, you simply reconnect to your main computer, then select Briefcase, and Update All. Next, the briefcase will prompt me with each file that has changed and allow me to selectively restore each one. I can see the original date and the change date. To update this file, I simply say Update. The briefcase will automatically replace the unmodified files on your main computer with the modified files in your briefcase. 
You do not need to move files you've worked on out of the briefcase or delete the existing copies. The briefcase removes the hassle of transporting files and allows you to focus your efforts on being more productive. Now let's take a look at TAPI. TAPI, which stands for Telephony API, provides a device-independent way of accessing communication features such as placing and establishing and monitoring the connection. The actual data sent across the modem is done through the Win32 COM API interface. If your application is not written for TAPI, it will be responsible for constructing the modem setup, AT command strings, and monitoring the port. For example, applications may be configured differently for different modem devices. This can be a complicated and time-consuming process. Windows 95 addresses this problem by providing support for TAPI aware application and Hayes compatible modems. To really understand the benefits that TAPI provides, just think back to communica communication applications you've used in the past. Every application had its own setup routine, which required entering the same information multiple times, such as your modem type, the COM port the modem was on, and the baud rate. For example, with Terminal from Windows 3.1, I have to enter in the same information, the baud rate, the data bits, the stop bits, the parity, the flow control, and the COM port the modem is on. However, with Windows 95's integration of TAPI, it's no longer necessary to enter in this information. From now on, as long as your application is TAPI aware, it can pull this commonly needed information from one location. TAPI can also provide information on where you're calling from. To see this, let's enter control panel, then double click on modems. Here we have our modem configuration information, which is available to all TAPIware applications. We also have dialing properties. Here we can configure the location that we're calling from. For example, let's say you use your laptop at work and at home. At work, you need to dial 9 to get an outside line, while at home, you dial asterisk 70 to disable call waiting. In the past, you'd have to change this manually. Now you can create multiple calling locations, one for home and one for work. Then whenever you start to make a connection from a TAPIware application, you can select the calling location you're calling from. Let's create a couple of calling locations now. To do this, I'll first change the name of the default location to work. I have several options here. Number one, to enter in my area code that I'm currently in, in my country and then special settings that I can enter, such as how I can access an outside line. In this case, I have to dial 9. If I have a calling card, I can enter it here. And I can also disable call waiting. To create another calling profile, I simply select New, enter in the new name of the profile, select Enter, and then fill out the information the same way. The only difference with this one is, since I'm at home, I don't need to enter a special number to get an outside line, I'll simply enter asterisk 70 to disable call waiting. Now I have multiple calling profiles. If you're wondering when you'll start seeing TAPI aware applications, don't worry. There will be several immediately available in the Windows 95 package. These include Microsoft Exchange, Dallup Networking, and HyperTerminal, which is our replacement to Terminal. To finish this section, I'd like to show you two more features of Windows 95, deferred printing and advanced power management. Windows 95 detects it's no longer connected to a local printer. It'll set the print queue to work offline. This allows you to continue working with no interruptions from the operating system. When Windows 95 detects the printer is available again, it will set the printer to work online and prompt you to print any jobs that have been spooled. For example, how many times have you been on an airplane or on the road with a portable and no connection to a printer, but you wanted to print? I know that sounds silly, but let's think about it. Let's say you're in Word for Windows and you're working on your month-end report. Instead of having to keep a post-it note to remind you to print this job whenever you get back to the office, you simply print. Windows 95 will defer your print jobs until it sees your printer is back. Let's see deferred printing in action. On the docking station, we have a printer installed. With this machine undocked, let's send a print job. To do that, I'll choose Programs, Accessories, and start WordPad, which is our replacement to write. 
Now that it's loaded, let me type something. Okay, now let me send the print job. I'll choose File and then Print. Select the printer that I want to use and say OK. Keep in mind that this machine is not connected to the printer. It sends a print job. I receive no error messages from the operating system. But notice in the lower right hand corner of your screen, I now have a printer icon. This is telling me that I have one document waiting to be printed. Let's take a side trip just for a minute. You'll notice that there are several other icons on my tray. I also have a speaker icon. This is because I have a sound card in this docking station. This allows me to change my volume. Next to that I have a PCMCIA icon. This tells me what PCMCIA cards I have currently in this laptop. And lastly, I have a battery icon. This shows me advanced power management features. This nice little utility shows me how much battery life I have left and also allows me to enable a message whenever the battery gets too low to notify me so I can switch batteries or plug it into an AC adapter. Now let's take this laptop and redock it and see the job come out. First I'll shut down the laptop. Choose OK. I won't save that document. And now it's safe to power it down. Now let's take the laptop, put it back into the docking station, and power it back on. Now that Windows 95 has started back up, it's notifying me that I have several print jobs waiting to be printed. Now I can select yes to send these print jobs and they should come out on the printer. There you have it. In this section, you've seen how Windows 95 has been enhanced to support mobile computers. I showed you how to add 32-bit protected mode support for PCMCIA devices. This allows you to save conventional memory and most importantly, be able to change your PCMCIA devices while your computer is up and running without needing to reboot. I showed you how to create and use hardware profiles. This makes changing your hardware configurations quick and easy. You have seen Tappy and how it makes it easier to configure Tappy Aware applications. You also saw how to create different calling locations that will save you time and effort when it comes to configuring your dialing properties. And lastly, I showed you deferred printing. This cool feature will allow you to continue to work and print even when your printer is not physically present. In the next section, we'll start a discussion of dial-up networking. I'll describe the new connectivity options that are available because of our support for more line and data protocols. In the next section, I will also show you how to connect to the internet and some of the tools we'll provide to make that connectivity quick and easy. Thanks, Ben. Now let's welcome back Mary Haggard with a TechNet tip. TechNet is a convenient and easy way to get technical information about Windows 95 and other Microsoft products. Mary? Hey, thanks, Elliot. Hi. Thanks for tuning in. 
You're watching today because you're interested in the remote connectivity features in Windows 95. I'm here to tell you more about supporting Windows 95 using Microsoft TechNet. As a TechNet subscriber, two CDs are delivered to your desk every month, containing the most up-to-date support, strategy, training materials, and utilities available from Microsoft. This information comes straight from the Microsoft Product Groups and Microsoft Product Support Services Division. Today, I will be using TechNet to show you how to implement what you see in today's TrainCast. Let's take a look at TechNet. Here I've defined a subset of content to show you the information we currently have available on Windows 95. Let me move through this defined subset in our table of contents to quickly show you the Windows 95 information. Here we have product facts on Windows 95, technical notes, the complete reviewer's guide, and the entire beta resource kit. We also have the current plug and play catalog and the Windows 95 knowledge base. We've worked hard to get very useful information to our customers before the release of the product. For instance, let me propose a scenario. After watching today's TrainCast, you're ready to take the plunge and begin planning the rollout of dial-up networking in your organization. You want to use Windows 95 as the client machine using PPP and Windows NT as the dial-up server. Ben discussed how to configure the Windows 95 client in this scenario. Earlier today, I spent about 20 minutes querying the TechNet CD to find information to supplement what you've learned today. After I performed the queries, I marked interesting chapters with bookmarks. Bookmarks allow you to return easily to information that interests you. Let's take a look at the few of the articles I found. Chapter 28 from the Windows 95 Resource Kit contains technology overviews, installation instructions, and detailed configuration guidelines for Windows 95 dial-up networking. Chapter 24, Introduction to Windows 95 Communications, contains a great overview of Windows 95 Communications to help you plan the implementation. And here's a knowledge base article that discusses installed components for typical, compact, or portable setup in Windows 95. This first segment is meant to give you a quick overview of the breadth and depth of information available on the TechNet CD prior to the release of Windows 95. Similar information is available on the CD for Microsoft product areas like Back Office, Microsoft's database and development products, Microsoft's Office and desktop applications, and information on technologies that affect many products such as Olay and WOSA. In fact, in the next segment, I'm going to show you the information available on TechNet to help you configure Windows NT 3.5 as the dial-up networking server in the scenario I proposed above. You'll be happy to see how easy it is to tie Windows 95 in with other Microsoft products. Thanks, Mary. Ben is here now with Alex Saunders to answer your question. Alex Saunders is a Windows 95 product manager and the resident expert on Microsoft Plus. I understand, Alec, that you're going to be demonstrating Microsoft Plus later on in, in the right. show. Great. Okay. Um, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, a lot of excitement is being generated by that product. Now, before we dive into questions and answers, you guessed it. I'm going to do yet another plug for the contest question. Since I'm not eligible to win that Dell computer system, somebody has to, and why, why not have it be you? Believe me, it's an easy way to win in Carta, and who knows, you might even be the grand prize winner. Um, oh, well. Today's question is, now get ready, name the feature of Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines or file servers. Call 1-800-254-4069 and answer that question. Okay, you ready? Let's get started. Um, we've got a fair number of questions that have come in from, uh, from our viewers, and uh, I'll give you a rest for a second, Ben. So um, why don't we uh, start, start with you, Alec? Uh, we had a call from Stan in, in Raleigh, and uh, basically Stan wanted to know if he was going to need to learn a new application in order to use dial-up networking. Well, Elliot, no, you won't have to learn to use a new application to use dial-up networking. In Windows 95, dial-up networking is built right into the operating system at a very fundamental level. It allows you to do, for instance, things like click on a connection on your network to be able to connect to a server out there on the network. And if you're not physically connected, Windows 95 knows enough to be able to simply create the dial-up connection dial for you and connect you up over your modem. So it's pretty intuitive, basically. Very intuitive, yes. Okay. So he's not going to have to go back to class just no. to learn how to connect. Super. Ben, uh, we had a call about PC 
MCIA cards. I, I guess that's on lots of people's minds. Right. A question uh, that we got was Sharon from San Jose wanted to know, will Windows 95 work with all three types of PC MCI cards, one, two, and, and type three? That's a good question, Elliot. Um, and first of all, let me point out, if you're having a hard time with that acronym, which is probably the <laughs> hardest industry acronym to learn, PCMCIA, uh, there's good news because they're starting to call them PC cards now. Excellent. So yeah, so if you're having a hard time, just, don't, just call them PC cards, forget about PCMCI. And to answer your question, yeah, we do work with all three types. Uh, let me explain the difference between the three types. Um, it really has to do with the, the thickness of the cards. Mm. Type 1 are very thin and they're used primarily for memory cards. Type 2 are a little bit thicker and you, you saw me use one in the, uh, in the demonstration. That's used for net cards and fax modems, things like that. Type 3 are pretty thick and they're used for devices such as hard drives, if you can believe that. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, Windows 95 supports all three types. The thing that you really need to be concerned about though when it comes to PC card support is what type of socket you have. Mm -hmm. And the socket is the device that you insert the PC card into. Mm -hmm. uh, Windows 95 provides protected mode drivers for Intel and Databook sockets. So your socket has to be either one of those or 100% compatible. If it's not, then either you're going to have to use real mode drivers or see if your manufacturer has a protected mode driver that you can load into Windows 95. I was on the plane the other day and put a card in and all of a sudden Windows 95 beeped that. Right. Is, is that healthy? Is that <laughs> Right, exactly. And Windows 95 will, will beep and notify you that, that a new card has been inserted only if you're using the protected mode drivers. I see. And can I, can I deactivate that beep? Oh, sure. You can deactivate the beep. The only thing is right now we can't change the beep. So you can't change the beep. So you can't beep. go, ah, yeah. yeah, or that'd stuff be, like that'd that. Be pretty cool. Okay, hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Product manager, future features <laughs> uh, coming here. Talking about airplanes, um, what about batteries? Uh, we got a, a phone call in from George up in Saratoga Springs, New York. And George basically wanted to know, would Windows 95 extend the life of his battery? Will it make it a nicer battery? <laughs> <laughs> What's it going to do to his battery? Depends on what you mean by a nicer, nicer battery. battery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a better, clearer uh, battery. Yeah. Not by itself it won't extend the life of your battery. However, Windows 95 does support the APM, the Advanced Power Management 1.1 specification. Okay. And that allows for the PC to be able to manage peripherals and uh, other devices to conserve power. In addition, if you're sitting on your airplane like you were, you can just take your mouse cursor and hang it over that little battery icon you see in the taskbar. And that will tell you right away exactly how much battery time you have left. So battery management becomes pretty easy as well. I see. Uh, we have a call here from uh, Carla. Carla is a help desk coordinator of financial services group in Boston. And uh, she's excited about deferred printing, but she wanted to have me ask you, um, you what about on a network printer? In other words, when Carla comes back on the road, um, or if her users that she supports come back from the road, uh, can they actually print deferred on the network, and, and how will that work? Right, exactly. You sure can. And I showed you with a local printer. And it, it works very similar for a network printer. In fact, um, the machine's set up. Why don't I just show that? Go for it. Okay. Da-do, okay. da-do, da-do, da-do. That's walking over to the demo music. All right. Um, I've got a, uh, a network printer set up on this machine and currently it's not connected to the network. So if I start up an application, like let's say I'll go into accessories and then start up WordPad. Type in something simple. Now I'll just do a file, print, okay, and select my printer and you'll notice where it says where. Uh, it's actually connected to a network printer. I'll say okay, it'll print the document. Now it's going to try to send this over the network. Now since I'm not physically connected, uh, it's, going to, it's going to give me a message back here in just a second. Okay, so it comes back and it tells me that there was an error writing to this printer. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. Since I'm not physically connected to my network, well of course it can't send it out over the wire. Uh, so it's asking me, do I want to save this print job? So I can say okay. Now, if you can notice, down in the very bottom right-hand corner of my screen, I have a little tiny printer icon with a small question mark on it. If I hold my mouse over it, it tells me that I have one document pending for me. Okay. Now, when I get back to the office and I hook my network back up and I log back in, it's going to come up and tell me that I have one document pending and ask me if I want to print them. Okay. Great. Uh, now, do they have to do anything? In other words, uh, when, when I'm logged back onto the network, do I have to 
activated or is it, is it somewhat automatic? Absolutely that? not. It's, it's, it's fully automatic. It's going to come up just like, just like I showed you with deferred printing with a local printer. It's going to come up and it's going to say, you have one document pending. Do you want to send it now? And I have a choice. I can send it now or I can wait until later. Mm -hmm. um, Alec, uh, when we were preparing for today's show, I, I saw you wearing this, this shirt that had the word plus on it with a big exclamation mark. And I hear that's your passion. And later on, you're going to be demonstrating that. But why don't you give me and the viewers just a coming attraction? Uh, what, sure. what is Plus? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a product that we've developed uh, as a companion for Windows 95 um, that really takes advantage of the higher processor speeds of 486 and Pentium PCs. It's designed to take Windows 95 just a step beyond what it is that it can do now. So it concentrates on using that processing power to do a couple things. It makes your PC run better. Um, in fact, it has some features that make the PC almost self-maintaining. It makes it look a little bit better because we've taken advantage of uh, some of the nicer video systems that are coming on the market now to uh, give some new looks and feels to Windows. And it's also got um, a piece that we call the Internet Jumpstart Kit in it, which is really an easy and convenient way for you to get onto the Internet. Now, I'm, I'm a 60s relic, I've been told. And I hear there's even something for me in, in, in yeah, the Yeah, we have got a 60s USA <laughs> desktop team that you are going to love. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and I've, I've become known on the show, as, because I'm not a Microsoft person, I always ask the hard questions. When will it ship? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's supposed to ship at the same time as Windows 95 ships, and we, we expect that you'll be able to go into a store and pick up Windows 95 and Microsoft Plus side by side. Super, super. Um, back to you, Ben. Um, we had a, um, a, a question from Kathy in Spokane, and uh, Kathy wanted to uh, know essentially, um, oh, where's the question? Uh, there it is, okay. Uh, can hardware profiles be linked to user profiles? Uh, good question, good question. We get asked that question a lot. Um, unfortunately, they cannot. In this release of Windows 95, you can't link user profiles and hardware profiles. Uh, and for those of you wondering what, what mm -hmm. user profiles are, those will actually be covered in the next show, mm -hmm. uh, System Administration with Mike Dunn. Um, you can, however, and I kind of showed this earlier, you can link hardware profiles to uh, MS-DOS multi-config menu options, but you can't link them to hardware profiles. Okay, one other technical question there. Uh, has Windows 95 been enhanced to support 16.550 URTs? And that actually is coming in from, from Art in Cambridge. Oh, yes, they sure have. Um, the, the difference between Windows 95 and Windows for Workgroups, Windows for Workgroups, in fact, supported 16.550 UARTs. Uh, a couple of big differences, though, between Windows 95 and Windows for Workgroups. Uh, one of the big differences is a big design goal in Windows 95 was to reduce a thing called interrupt latency. And what that means is we try and have Windows 95 service the COM port more often, so we reduce COM buffer overflows. Uh, so that would help with all the UARTs. Uh, a big change in Windows 95 also is you no longer have to go into your system.ini file and make you are specific settings yourself. Now all those changes can be made through the Windows 95 user interface. Mm -hmm. And either one of you handle this one. Um, we got a call from a road warrior who uh, wants to know, can it remember my settings when I'm in Seattle versus when I'm in Florida? Okay, I, I can answer that sure. one. Sure. Uh, uh, you're talking about like, uh, like dialing properties? Right, exactly. Okay, yeah, we sure can. With Tappy, we have a thing called dialing properties. And you can set that up for different locations. For example, I'm on the road as well as you are. So I've got a setting for home, which disables call waiting. I've got a setting for work, which disable, or which gets me an outside line by pressing 9 before I call. And I've got a setting for the hotel that I'm in, which does an 8 before, I, before it dials the number. Um, you can set those different locations. And whenever you're in a uh, Tappyware application and you go to dial, you can very easily select which location you're in. So Windows will make the changes it needs to to get an outside line. Um, the thing is, you can't link these locations to hardware profiles right. like a docked and undocked state. Although it could be done, we just don't know where you're at. Right. Well, someday there'll be a GPS locator <laughs> that'll, that'll right, tell me right, where, right. where I am. Um, we've got an intriguing call that came in from Stuart. Stuart's mm -hmm. a, uh, an analyst who reports directly to the CIO in his company. And he basically wanted to say, Basic, could you give him sort of the big view? In other words, how will Windows 95 help people in their organization that are mobile, that are portable? In other words, what's, maybe give him the 2,000-foot sure. view so he can build the case for sure. his manager. Sure. There's basically three ways that Windows 95 is going to help you in your organization if you're supporting mobile people. First of all, we have support for portable PC hardware, things like the PCMCIA cards that you were talking about, docking stations, port replicators, those sorts of things. 
As well, Windows 95 is going to help you stay connected. The dial-up networking piece allows you to get at your data on your corporate network. It's got built-in support for email, for fax. So wherever you are, you can be connected back up with your office. Mm -hmm. and the last thing that it's going to do is portability introduces some unique organizational problems that you have to deal with. So Windows 95 contains some features like the briefcase, which is mm -hmm. a tool which allows you to sync files between your portable PC and a PC on your network or a server, that kind of thing. Plus, it also has a dial-up networking, or sorry, a, a direct connect component, mm -hmm. a cable connect mm -hmm. component that makes it very easy to transfer data back and forth between uh, uh, mobile PCs and stationary PCs. And my guess is that all three of us <laughs> have been, been using it in, in, a, in a mobile environment. Mm -hmm. and very definitely. Well, what's been the biggest benefit for, for you and as you, you use the laptop environment? Well, to be honest with you, I never really used my laptop. I mean, I had it, but having Windows 3.1 on it and trying to support PCMCIA and different prof profiles for when I was docked and undocked, it could be done, but it was a little bit challenging. Win95, and you know, I, I'm, I work for Microsoft, but I'm, you know, I don't want to sound biased, but Win95 just makes using my portable so much easier. Adds val really value to life. I'm huh? really more productive. Mm -hmm. Also, Alec brought up another good point. He mentioned direct cable connect, which I really didn't go into, but it uses dial-up networking, uh, and it's it's an enhancement. It goes beyond what we offered with DOS Interlink. Right. Yeah, they're not compatible with an, with one another, but it's a great way to connect two machines together. And maybe we can talk about that in in, in the next section and sure. find out some of the ways you're you're using it. Well, that's all the time that we have in this segment. And thanks for calling in with your questions, and we want lots more. Ben, why don't you uh, head back to your station? And I'd like to thank you, Alec, for, for your participation in this first segment. Please feel free to call in with your questions anytime during the broadcast. Engineers are standing by, and the number is 206-635-7066. In this next section, Ben will demonstrate connectivity through the Windows 95 dial-up networking client. Ben? In this section, we'll begin our discussion of dial-up networking. Dial-up networking is becoming more popular because of the increase in mobile computing. One of the most common features used by mobile users is accessing other machines in a corporate network or accessing the internet. There are also more desktop users accessing corporate networks and the internet from home. Windows 95 provides support to connect to remote servers using a modem and the networking software built into Windows 95. Windows for Workgroups 311 Windows NT 3.1 and 3.5 also provide similar support. The differences are primarily in the protocols they use and their dial-up server support. Dial-up networking will allow a Windows 95 client to connect remotely to many different network systems, such as Windows for Workgroups 3.1, Windows NT, Network Connect servers, dial-in routers, and of course, other Windows 95 machines. Dial-up networking extends the current Microsoft RAS product to reflect industry standards more closely and to give you more flexibility of protocol usage for the remote connection. At this point, you're probably wondering how to connect a Windows 95 machine to the servers I mentioned a moment ago. There are three ways to make a connection to a remote server. First, there's explicit, which means to manually start the connection yourself. Second is implicit which means if Windows 95 cannot find the connection on the LAN, it'll prompt you to try a dial-up connection. And third is application invoked, which means if your application is smart enough, it can establish a connection to a dial-up resource itself. Now let's walk through the steps of setting up a dial-up connection. To create a dial-up connection, start my computer and then choose dial-up networking. To create a connection, double click on Make New Connection. This will start the Make New Connection wizard. First, it asks for a friendly name. So I want to make a connection to my corporate network. So I'll enter in Corporate Network. Also, it wants to know which modem I want to use. And I'll select Next. Now it wants the phone number that I'm going to dial to connect to my corporate network. I'll enter that in now. and then select enter. Next, all I have to do is check my friendly name and then select finish to complete making this connection. And that's all there is to it. To start an explicit connection, 
simply double click on the connection icon you just created. On this, on this screen you'll be prompted for a couple of things. Number one, your username and your password. This password can be used to log you into an NT domain or a NetWare server, or it could be used as a password to connect you to the dial-up server. We'll talk more about dial-up security in, lesson, in the next section. So I'll enter in my password. I can also have Windows 95 remember my password. This is kind of a nice feature, so I don't have to enter in my password every time I start up. Although with this enabled, my security goes down the drain. Next, it has a phone number it's going to dial. And if you recall from the TAPI discussion, I can select my dialing properties. Since I'm at work, I'll want to select the work option. And then it shows me the number that it's going to dial. And then all I need to do is say connect. The next thing I'll see is a status box showing me what's going on. At first, it's just dialing. Okay. Now it's verifying my username and password. Next, it logs me onto the network, and then I'm connected. Here I see what baud rate I'm connected at and how long I've been connected. I also have two other buttons, a disconnect button, which will disconnect this connection, and a details button, which will tell me the type of server that I've dialed into and the data protocols that I'm using. Now it's just like I'm connected to my LAN. The next type of connection is implicit. An implicit dial-up networking connection is performed when you or an application attempts to connect to a network resource that is not available through the network adapter. Whenever Windows 95 cannot find a machine on your local network, it will prompt you to use dial-up networking to try and make the connection. For example, if I select Start, then Run, and type in the name of a resource that I know is not on my physical network, for example, Traincast Data, then select Enter. Windows 95 prompts me to, to try and make this connection through dial-up networking. This will come in handy when you have your portable computer on the road or at home. Several other types of network activities can cause implicit dial-up networking connections to start. Things such as trying to use a persistent network resource, such as a network drive you connect to every time you start Windows 95. Or an application trying to connect to a name pipe or a file, such as a mail application might try and do. Or an application trying to print to remote network printer. The third type of connection is application invoked. The dial-up networking session API is designed to easily establish a remote network connection. This API will be used primarily by network applications, such as the Windows 95 Shell and Microsoft Exchange. This will provide a seamless way for applications to make remote connections with very little user intervention. We will see an example of this later on when I get to Exchange and look at the Internet and CompuServe mail access. Windows 95 dial-up networking architecture is similar to the networking architecture using a network adapter that you learned about in TrainCast show number four, Networking. Dial-up networking uses an application layer to package the request, an interface to pass the request to a data protocol, and a line protocol to send the data on the telephone line. Data protocols package the data from the application and get it ready for transmission on a medium. Line protocols, on the other hand, are responsible for packaging the message from the data protocol onto the medium, such as serial or ISDN. The supported data protocols in Windows 95 are NetBuoy, IPX, and TCPIP, which for the most part are the same as our network data protocols we use. The supported line protocols by the Windows 95 dial networking client are Remote Access Services, or RAS, Point-to-Point -point Protocol, or PPP, 
Serial Line Interface Protocol, SLIP, which by the way will only be available in the Windows 95 Resource Kit, and Network Connect, NRN. This is very important. Because of the support for so many line protocols, this is what gives us the ability to connect your Windows 95 computer to so many other dial-up servers. Let's take this opportunity to talk more about line protocols. The point-to-point -point line protocol, which is widely supported in Windows 95, is also used by many internet service providers. PPP was designed to define a standard encapsulation protocol for the transport of different network data protocols across serial links. This means PPP supports multiple data protocols on the connection at the same time. PPP also supports link quality testing, header compression, and error detection. To manually set your connection to use the PPP line protocol, secondary click on your connection through dial-up networking, then choose properties. On the properties page, we have a server type button. Selecting that will give us the ability to manually select what type of server we'll be dialing into. To manually select a PPP server, just leave it as the default. PPP, Windows 95, Windows NT35, Internet. Just like networking with a network interface card, the Windows 95 client must have a data protocol bound to the Microsoft dial-up adapter in Control Panel Network. The data protocols supported by the PPP line protocol are TCPIP, IPX, and NetBuoy. If you're using TCPIP on several different connections, you may find that your TCPIP settings may need to be different for each connection. For example, let's say you're on a corporate network using TCPIP, and you also have a dial-up connection to an internet service provider where you also need TCPIP. It seems like you might have a problem with keeping separate IP addresses for each connection, but Windows 95 makes this process simple and easy. From within dial-up networking, secondary click on your connection, choose properties, then click on server type. Here we can set all of the data protocols that we want to use for this connection. As for TCP IP, we can click on the TCP IP settings button and manually enter all the TCP IP settings we want to use for this connection, such as our IP address, our DNS server, and our WIN server. At this point, you may be wondering what type of machine can be a point-to-point -point server. The machines out there that can be PPP servers are computers running the Windows 95 dial-up networking server, which, by the way, is only available in the Microsoft Plus product. Windows NT version 3.5, Shiva Land Rovers, some internet service providers, as well as other third-party remote access products. It's important to remember that the Windows 95 dial-up server will only be available in the Microsoft Plus for Windows 95 product, which will be available when Windows 95 ships. When the Windows 95 dial-up networking client is using the PPP line protocol, you'll be able to see several resources. Those include the Internet. Access to the Internet can be attained through an Internet service provider or a Windows NT 3.5 PPP server that is set up as a gateway to the Internet. The data protocol that you would use is TCP IP. You can also see Netware servers. Netware servers can be seen if the Windows 95 client is using the Client for Netware Networks and the Protected Mode IPX protocol which will need to be bound to the Microsoft dial-up adapter. The client must be, using, must be dialing into a Windows NT version 3.5 server, a Windows 95 dial-up networking server, or a third-party router, such as a Shiva Land Rover configured with IPX and the point-to-point -point line protocol. An important thing to note is when using dial-up networking with IPX and you're on a local network using IPX, the IPX protocol will be disabled on your local network card while you're connected through dial-up networking. The reason for this is so your machine doesn't become an IPX router routing packets from your local network onto your dial-up networking connection. 
SMB server resources on the LAN can be viewed with protocols common to both the Windows 95 dial-up networking server and the SMB server on the LAN. The client can access SMB servers on the LAN through the dial-up networking server, NetBIOS Gateway, or the IPX router. We'll discuss both of these in the next section, the dial-up server. Another important thing to note is Windows 95 supports a dial-up network client to only use the NetBuoy or IPX protocols to another Windows 95 dial-up network server. TCP IP to a Windows 95 dial-up network server is not supported. The Windows 95 dial-up client may use TCP IP to a Windows NT35 server or a PPP service provider to the internet. Now that we've talked about the PPP line protocol, let's move on and talk about the RAS line protocol. RAS has been available in various Microsoft products since the release of LAN Manager version 2.1. RAS is a proprietary based protocol based on async buoy, which is basically net buoy set up to work on a slow link. RAS is a fast connection type, but does not allow for multiple protocols or data compression like the point-to-point -point line protocol does. With the RAS line protocol, you can dial in and connect to your Windows for Workgroups 311 and Windows NT31 computers set up with the RAS dial-up server. If you're wishing to connect to other Windows 95 or Windows NT version 3.5 dial-up servers, then you'll want to use the PPP line protocol because of all the enhancements it provides over RAS. The RAS line protocol will only support the NetBuoy data protocol. To get NetBuoy over RAS, you need to have NetBuoy installed and bound to the dial-up networking adapter in Control Panel Network. Dial-up networking can determine when the connection is being made if the client or the server should be using the RAS line protocol. This is a pretty nice feature because it keeps you from having to worry about what type of dial-up server you're dialing into. The machines out there that can be RAS servers or computers running the Windows 95 dial-up networking server, which is available in the Microsoft Plus package, Windows NT version 3.1, and Windows NT version 3.5 with the dial-up networking server enabled, and Windows for Workgroups version 3.1 with the RAS dial-up networking server, which is available from our download service. Resources that can be seen by a Windows 95 dial-up client using RAS are dial-up server resources, which means any resources shared off the dial-up server, and any SMB server resources on the LAN. Now, let's talk about the SLIP line protocol. SLIP, which stands for Serial Line Interface Protocol, has been used as an internet line protocol for years. SLIP is simple to implement and works well in many environments. A typical environment for SLIP is internet connectivity through an internet service provider or remote access to a private TCP IP based WAN. Its simplicity, however, leaves it with a number of deficiencies. Some of the limitations of SLIP are no addressing. SLIP does not provide any mechanism for host to communicate addressing information with each other. Thus, both computers in a SLIP connection must know each other's IP address for routing purposes. This means that features such as DHCP will not be available to a SLIP connection. You'll be prompted for the IP address of the client every time a SLIP connection is attempted. Another limitation is no protocol identification. Unlike PPP, SLIP only supports one data protocol at a time. This means you'll not be able to connect to any servers on the network running a different data protocol than you are. For example, if you're connected to a network using TCP IP, you will not be able to see any servers that are not running at TCP IP. Another limitation is no error correction and detection. SLIP provides no error correction or error detection mechanism. And the final limitation with SLIP is no compression. SLIP provides no mechanism for compressing the entire packet. Although SLIP does not su directly support compression of the entire data packet, a specification exists to allow compression of just the IP header portion of a TCP IP data packet. This is called compressed SLIP, or CSLIP. 
C-slip allows the compression of the IP header to a few bytes, saving a lot of data transfer overhead. It's important to note, SLIP and C-slip support will only be available in the Windows 95 Resource Kit. To install SLIP or C-slip, use the Add Remove Program Wizard from Control Panel. The data protocol supported by SLIP and C-slip is TCPIP. The machines out there that can be SLIP and C-slip servers are Internet Service Provider, and any third-party remote access product. Resources seen by Windows 95 dial-up networking client using SLIP are the Internet and private TCP IP based WANs. SLIP is also supported by various remote access products to allow dial-in access to private TCP IP based WANs. Now that you know what SLIP is, let's create a dial-up connection to an Internet service provider using the SLIP line protocol. To do this, we'll start by double-clicking on My Computer. Then we'll double-click on Dial-Up Networking. To set up our new connection, we need to double-click on Make New Connection. Here we'll enter in the friendly name for our connection, which I'll enter in Slip Connection to the Internet. And then choose Next. Now I need to enter in my telephone number. and choose next again. Double click, double check my friendly name, which I'll probably want to change that. And then choose finish. Okay. Now to finish setting up our connection, we need to secondary click on it, and then choose properties. Next choose server type. To explicitly set that we're dialing into a slip server, we need to drop down this dialog box and choose slip Unix connection. Also notice that the only data protocol SLIP supports is TCP IP. Now I need to enter in my TCP IP settings. First I'll enter in my IP address. And now I'll enter in my DNS server. When that's completed, I'll choose OK. OK again. One more thing I need to do before this connection is complete. I need to select Configure, Options, and bring up terminal window after dialing. The reason I do this is because Windows 95 is not able to pass your username and password to some dial-up server types. What this will do is bring up a terminal window after the connection is established and allow me to enter my password and my username manually. I'll choose OK. OK. Now we're ready to connect to the Internet. I'll do this by double-clicking on my connection icon, making sure the phone number's right, and also notice if I was at home, I could change my dialing from properties. And now I'll choose Connect. Now that I've entered my username and my password and logged in to my internet service provider, I can close down this terminal screen by choosing continue. Now I'm logging onto the network. And I'm connected. Now I can run any WinSockets based application such as Mosaic, Netscape, FTP, or the worldwide web browser that comes with
Plus for Windows 95, which we'll see in a minute. Now that you've seen the slip connection, I'll go ahead and disconnect. The last line protocol that the Windows 95 dial-up networking client supports is Network Connect. Novell offers a remote access product for Netware Networks called Network Connect. Network Connect is installed as a series of NLMs on a Netware server. Network Connect provides remote access services via modems, modem sharing and polling, and remote access of workstations. An important thing to note is the Windows 95 dial-up networking client only takes advantage of Network Connect's remote access services. If you need the other two services, modem pooling and remote computer control, you must use Novell Netware's Connect client software. The data protocol supported by Network Connect is IPX only. Resources seen by Windows 95 dial-up networking clients using IPX over Network Connect are Netware servers on the LAN connected to the Network Connect server. Now let's see Network Connect in action. To create a Network Connect connection, I'll start by double-clicking on my computer, double-click on Dial-Up Networking, and then double-click on Make New Connection. I'll enter in my friendly name, which will be Network Connect. Then I'll choose Next. Next, I need to enter in the telephone number. and then choose Next. Double check my friendly name, and then choose Finish. Just like the slip connection, there's a couple more things I need to do before this is complete. I'll secondary click on the connection icon, choose Properties, and then choose Server Type. Here I also have to explicitly set what type of server I'm dialing into, which is Network Connect. Choose OK, then choose OK again. Now let's connect to this Network Connect server. I'll do this by double clicking on this icon, checking my username and password, the phone number and where I'm dialing from, and then choose connect. Okay, now it's verified my username and password and is logging me onto the network. Next, it processes my Netware logon scripts that are on the Netware server that I'm dialing into. Now I'm connected. At this point, I have access to all the Netware servers on the LAN that are connected to the Netware Connect server. I know that was a lot of information. Let's take a moment to review our connection options. The Windows 95 dial-up networking client supports connecting to SMB-based LAN server resources in three ways. Connecting to a Windows 95 dial-up networking server using the RAS or PPP line protocol connecting to a Windows NT version 3.1 or 3.5 RAS server, or a Windows NT 3.5 remote access server using the point-to-point -point line protocol, or connecting to a third-party IPX or IP router that's using the point-to-point -point line protocol. The Windows 95 dial-up networking client also supports connecting to Netware resources in four ways. First, connecting to a Netware Connect server which then provides access to the Novell Netware servers on the LAN. Next, connecting to a Windows 95 dial-up networking server, which uses IPX to route Netware servers on the LAN. Third, Windows NT version 3.5 remote access server, which uses IPX to route to Netware servers on the LAN. And finally, third-party IPX routers, such as a Shiva Land Rover you will generally not be concerned with the line and data protocols you use. This is something that dial-up networking can negotiate automatically when dialing another PPP or RAS host. PPP is the default line protocol. PPP will be tried first, but if the server does not support PPP, RAS will be tried next. Network Connect, SLIP, and CSLIP are never negotiated 
by Windows 95 dial-up networking. To connect to a SLIP or Network Connect server, you should manually select the connection line protocol when configuring the Microsoft dial-up adapter. You have seen setting up a SLIP connection to the Internet. Now let's take a look at an easier option. Windows 95 offers extensive options to users wishing to connect to the Internet. As a foundation, Windows 95 includes the TCP IP protocol stack, the WinSockets interface, and the dial-up software necessary for accessing and using Windows-based applications on the Internet. We've already looked at the dial-up component. Now let's take a closer look at the protocols. Windows 95 supports the two most popular remote line protocols to the Internet, SLIP and PPP. With either of these, you'll be able to use Windows 95 to take advantage of the expanding services and information on the Internet. You can connect to the Internet three different ways. First, use a PPP connection with TCP IP to an Internet service provider directly. Second, use a SLIP or CSLIP connection with TCP IP to an Internet service provider. And third, you can use a PPP connection with TCP IP through a Windows NT server or some other third-party PPP server. It's important to note that a Windows 95 dial-up networking server cannot provide access to Internet resources for a PPP client. There is no IP router built into Windows 95 to provide this service. Before you use Windows 95 to access the Internet, you must have an Internet account with an Internet service provider. This service is available through different online services such as Microsoft Network, CompuServe, and America Online, as well as dedicated service providers that provide Internet access only. To configure dial-up networking to work with an Internet service provider, you'll need the following information which can be obtained from your Internet service provider. You'll need your username, your password, your service provider's access phone number, does your provider support SLIP, CSLIP, or PPP, your host and domain name, your DNS server IP address, and your logon procedure, whether or not you need to bring up a terminal window to log onto the system. If the service provider requires you to use a dedicated static IP address every time you dial in, you will also need the following information. Your IP address, your subnet mask, and the IP address of the default gateway. Because of the differences between various service providers, not all of the above information will always be required. With this information, you'll need to make sure the Microsoft dial-up adapter is installed through Control Panel Network and make sure TCP IP is bound to the adapter. I mentioned in the intro a product called Microsoft Plus, which provides a variety of innovative internet features. Included is an advanced wizard feature that makes connecting to the internet easy and provides clear information about navigating the internet that will allow you to feel comfortable and informed about how you can explore the internet. Let's take a closer look at Microsoft Plus Internet Install Wizard. To start the wizard, the first thing we need to do is install Microsoft Plus on this system. To do that, I'll start my computer, select the Plus directory, and then start setup. First screen provides me with some licensing agreements. After I read the screen, I'll choose continue. It'll ask for my name and my organization. I'll choose OK and then verify it. And then it gives me my product ID. This is very important. Make sure you write down your product ID before calling in for technical support. Now setup is searching for installed components. On the next screen, I have two ways of installing Microsoft Plus. I have a typical install and a custom install. 
It's recommended, if you're new to the Microsoft Plus product, that you choose Typical. This will install the most commonly used options in Microsoft Plus. Now setup will check for the necessary disk space. And we'll now begin copying the files I need. Now that we've finished copying the files, the setup program will finish updating our system. Now the Plus setup program has launched the Internet Setup Wizard. This wizard makes connecting to the Internet simple. I'll start by clicking Next. Now it wants to know how I'm going to connect to the Internet, either with my phone line or through my local, access, local area network. 
I'll say next. Now it's asking me what internet provider I want to use. I have two choices here. I can choose the Microsoft network or I can use an account with an internet service provider. For this example, I'll use the Microsoft network. During the setup process, I may be prompted for files needed from the plus setup directory. I'll enter in the location of my setup directory. Okay, and off we go. Now the wizard is asking me if I'm a member of the Microsoft network. Since I'm not, I'll say no, sign me up. Next, I'm prompted with a dialog box, which is essentially the table of contents to the Microsoft network. Some of the services that the Microsoft network provides are access to the internet, electronic mail, headlines on financial news, and services from hardware and software vendors. In all, MSN provides information from hundreds of companies. To continue on, we'll select click. Now MSN needs my area code and the first three digits of my phone number. I'll enter that and then choose OK. Now MSN wants to connect to the MSN server to download the latest product information and update my list of local phone numbers. I'll click on connect. Okay, now that, it's, now that it's finished connecting, I need to fill out some more information. First, I need to tell it my name and address. Okay, now let me take a moment to fill out the required information. Okay, and with that complete, I'll choose OK. Next, I need to select my method of payment. Okay, then choose OK. Next, I need to read the rules. With that completed, I'll say I agree. Now I'm ready to join the Microsoft network. Okay, and with that completed, I'll say connect. Now, 
I'll enter in a member ID for myself and a password. Now I'm a member of the Microsoft Network and have complete access to all of the services it provides. Now that we've set up MSN to give us internet connectivity, let's use the Internet Explorer that comes with Microsoft Plus to surf the internet. To do this, double click on your internet connection icon on your desktop. This is a nice tool because you don't have to have an internet service provider account just to learn about the internet. My recommendation would be when you start to play with the internet, you spend some time here learning about the internet. For example, how you move around and what services are available out there. In this tool, I have a couple of options. Number one, I can explore the internet with several websites that have already been entered in for me. Or I can search the internet for different resources. In this example, let's go to the Microsoft World Wide Web page. On the Microsoft World Wide Web page, we have tons of information that you might find useful. Things such as technical support on a variety of our products, and even a little information on Microsoft TV. But let's not limit ourselves with the Microsoft World Wide Web page. Let's take a look at another one. As you can see, the simple interface will let you explore some popular internet sites, search for a specific location on the internet, or just simply learn more about how to navigate on the internet. The World Wide Web on the internet is rich with multimedia content. Microsoft Plus's Internet Explorer can help you access this information quickly and easily. In this section, you have seen how the Windows 95 dial-up networking client has been enhanced to provide you with more connectivity options such as connecting to NetWare servers and to the Internet. I showed you the different connection options, explicit, implicit, and application invoked. I also showed you how to create a connection. We discussed the difference between data and line protocols and explained what line protocols are going to be supported under Windows 95. You have seen what resources will be available when you use the PPP, RAS, SLIP, CSLIP, and Network Connect line protocols. Last and most importantly, I showed you how to connect to the Internet and some of the Internet tools we will provide for Windows 95. In the next section, we'll finish our discussion of dial-up networking using the Microsoft Plus product. Then I will describe the Windows 95 dial-up networking server and explain who can connect to a Windows 95 dial-up server and what they'll see. I'll discuss the line protocols that are available for the dial-up server and how to configure them. Lastly, We'll see what security is available for the dial-up server. Let's continue working on the scenario I proposed earlier. In order to deploy dial-up networking utilizing Windows 95 and Windows NT, you are going to need to know how to configure the Windows NT server as a PPP server. The rest of the articles in my bookmark list pertain to Windows NT. For instance, here's a chapter from the networking book of the Windows NT resource kit. It contains an overview of remote access service, 
point-to-point -point protocol, RAS connection sequence, NetBIOS gateway, as well as SLIP. Going back to my bookmark list, here's an example of a white paper that explains in detail how to deploy RAS into your corporation. As I mentioned above, I perform queries to find this information and place the bookmarks. Let me quickly show you how to perform a query on Windows NT 3.5. In the query screen, I'll type Windows NT 3.5. Wow! As you can see, more than 300 entries came up. So I'm going to refine my search using the Find Again feature. I'm going to type RAS and PPP and search just those last topics that I just found. As you can see, I use the AND operator to find instances of RAS and PPP in my query results. TechNet uses a full-text Boolean search engine that allows you to create targeted queries that quickly locate specific information. Let's take a look at what we have found. Here's the Windows NT chapter that I showed before. And here's even more information on enabling PPP logging in Windows NT 3.5. As you've seen today, Microsoft TechNet is a great source of information for integrating, administering, and supporting Microsoft solutions. If you're a systems administrator, you can get a jump on learning about Windows 95 through the TechNet CD. You've seen today the breadth of information already available several months before the release of the product. Watch for the Windows 95 feature issue of TechNet in August, and thanks for tuning in to the TechNet Tips portion of this TrainCast broadcast. Thanks, Mary. Ben and Alec have joined me once again for our question and answer session. It looks like our engineers have been busy. Remember, these engineers will be available throughout the show. Their number is 206-635-7066. Okay, time for questions. You ready? Okay. <laughs> okay uh, Alec, you're up first. Um, uh, Jerry Hudson Martin from Boston, Massachusetts called and wanted to understand when in their organization would they deploy Windows NT versus deploying Windows 95? But what's sort of the difference and how, what's the decision making? Decision-making process? Well, um, I mean, for everybody who has like a multi-processor alpha system hanging around the house, I, I think that they should definitely run Windows NT. I mean, big, it's, yeah, big that's right. Resources, big right. iron. Um, we, but um, uh, win Windows NT is a great is a great operating system for systems that require multi-processor support, that need to be able to run on risk-based machines, that have government-level security, those kinds of things. It's very good for that kind of industrial strength application. And there's a certain class of applications, like for instance, uh, CAD or traders' workstations, that are very, very suited to this kind of an operating system. But for the vast majority of mainstream desktops, we think that Windows 95 is the operating system that they'll run. And Windows 95 has some real advantages over Windows NT for that kind of uh, an environment as well. I mean, amongst which is the fact that it has much lower hardware requirements mm -hmm. than Windows NT does. And it's also much more backwards compatible with today's existing applications. Now, having said that, I think that in most environments, you're going to find that there will be a mix of both right. of them depending on the needs of the individual users. You know, the networks themselves will be heterogeneous with, with different workstations running different operating systems. I mean, the real power user might end up with NT if, yeah. if they have graphics needs and the average workstation might yeah, be Windows Yeah, for, for everyday office workstations, we expect that they'll mostly be running Windows 95. Okay, so hear that, Jerry. Use that as your, your guide for that. Uh, then we have a call from uh, Gregory Rosales in Houston, Texas. Okay. And Gregory is, is uh, using the Windows uh, preview program right now. Right. And Gregory would like to know how does he get slip connectivity now w within dial-up networking? Okay, good question, good question. Uh, you probably notice that slip isn't one of your options uh, when you go to set up what type of dial-in server you're calling into. Uh, and the reason for that is because slip support isn't going to ship directly with the product. Right now, you can get slip support by going into uh, Add Remove Software, uh, going into Windows Setup, choosing Have Disk, and you can find slip uh, under, uh, under the admin directory that's on your uh, WPP uh, CD. Uh, slip support's going to ship on the uh, resource kit when that becomes available with the release of Windows 95. Got you. 
Uh, well, we're going to go to a briefcase question. By the way, for those people interested in the contest, this briefcase question might be very fundamental to trying to win an Encarta disc and, and a Dell multimedia computer. Um, <laughs> but uh, we talked earlier about briefcase, and we were talking about some of the advantages for mobile yeah, yeah. computing. How are you using briefcase? Uh, Me? Um, I, I use it in a couple of different ways, um, but the most important way that I use is I have two PCs that, that I work with every day. I have a, um, a desktop machine that uh, sits in my, in my office. It's a Pentium machine. And I also have a, a notebook PC. Mm -hmm. And the notebook PC is great. It's my mobile office. I take it wherever I go. I take it at home. I work at home with it. Uh, I work on airplanes all over the place with it. But it's also a bit slower than the Pentium machine. And there are times when I want to be upgrading software or whatever else. So I keep the briefcase on the Pentium machine and sync it with the notebook machine all the time. It allows me to have an automatic backup and it also allows me to work on the files wherever they are. Okay, let me, let me be an advocate for the, the ultimately untechy user. When you say synchronize, what do you mean? Okay, uh, what happens is all the files that are on my uh, notebook PC, all of my data files get copied. They get brought up to date with the ones that are on the um, uh, desktop machine and vice versa. So if I'm working on the machine on a file on my desktop machine and the copy that's on my local PC gets out of date, then what happens is the briefcase will make sure that the one that's on my local PC is up to date before I go home at night. Like a Vulcan mind lock. For yeah, that's our, exactly for it. Our yeah, Star yeah. Trekkers that, that are out there. And it does it at the file level or at the record level? It does it at the file level right out of the box with right. Windows 95. However, <laughs> individual applications can install new briefcase reconciliation handlers is Got what you. they're called. And what that means is that I can have multiple people working on a document, like a Word document or an Excel document or something like that, and the briefcase will manage merging all the changes from all those different people back into a single cohesive document. Which is going to be real valuable, I guess, for work group kinds of exactly. computing. Yeah, and, that's exactly and, right. in, in that case, that, that, that's real exciting. Once again, we'll keep coming back to, to, to briefcase along the while. Um, Andy Avell um, asked a question. We don't know where Andy's based, so in the greater North American region. Uh, Andy wants to know, I have no dial-up network um, icon under my computer. How do I get it there? In other okay. words, if, there's, if they don't have an icon, where do they go to like right, get icons? Right. You probably noticed whenever I started up dial-up networking, I just went to my computer and it was right there. It was the last option, dial-up networking. To get that installed, what you need to do is either install it, install that option when you set up Windows 95, or you can go into Control Panel, Add Remove Programs. There's a Windows Setup tab. Okay, you select that. There's a Communications option. Under Communications is Dial-up Networking. Make sure you have that selected. Go through the steps. It'll require your CD or your diskettes or however you installed, and then you'll have a Dial-up Networking icon in my computer. Got you. Okay. And for and Mike uh, Pirouez in Wichita, Kansas wants to know, when using my briefcase to synchronize files, what happens if another user updates the file that is in my briefcase? Okay. Good question. Um, well, there's a, there's a couple of things. We, we've been kind of talking about the briefcase and, and a lot of the different options. Uh, if I have, if have my portable set up and I have an, a, 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 pro, a, a data file in my briefcase, there's really nothing stopping Alec, let's say, from coming to my computer and opening up briefcase and editing that file. The, the only way I could prevent that would say, you know, put a password on my screensaver or put some type of security on my PC. So if he makes changes to the file, it, it's going to update in my briefcase. Uh, it won't update the source until I explicitly say briefcase and update. And then it'll tell me the source and the destination and, and the file dates and sizes and what's changed and give me an option to update. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is live TV, and I know we talked about doing a demo before. Right. Is that going to be on the one on the failed dial-up connection, or is that one of the ones we just talked about? Uh, actually, about um, we, can, we can do a demo on uh, some of the diagnostic tools that someone will have to, to help them figure out a failed connection. Do you want another demo? Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so let, let me set this up before, <laughs> before we go into it. We get, a, we get a lot of requests. A lot of customers want to, want to troubleshoot their own problems. Right. They, they don't want to have to call into product support. Mm -hmm. And you know they want to figure it out on their own. Okay, a lot of people are getting a lot smarter out there. We provide a lot of different tools in Windows 95 to help the end user figure out their own problems mm -hmm. if they want to go that route. Uh, mm -hmm. We provide three log files inside Windows 95 to help with with a uh, with with any type of communication problems. We provide a file called pppplog.txt. This file contains uh, information about when you try and make a PPP connection to a PPP server. So if that fails, it can give you some information or some insight as to, mm -hmm. as to what happened. 
we have a uh, modem log.txt that, that a user can right. enable. And this is really good for the more advanced users. You can see the AT commands that get sent to your modem and the responses you get back. Uh, and there's one more file that you can use. It's called modemdet.log. That's created whenever we try and detect your modem. And you can kind of look at that and get some insight as to what we went through to find your modem out there. Um, we also provide another program, which let me show yeah, you well, now. Why don't you do a, a quick that one minute demo, if you can, over there. And okay. Inside Windows 95, we provide a diagnostic tool to help you troubleshoot uh, modem connectivity problems. And to get to that, you go into, my, in, into Control Panel, go into Modems. And if you'll notice on the screen, I have a Diagnostic tab. Click on that, select my COM port, and you can see the modem listed. And I can click on More Info. And what it's going to do is query the modem. It'll take a couple of seconds. OK, and then it's going to come back and give me some vital information about my modem. Some of you might find this information useful, but the most important thing here is, if we're able to do this, then Windows 95 is able to communicate with your modem. We're getting to the hardware. Uh, if this failed, then you know we're not getting to the hardware. If it works and you're still having a problem, it might be a configuration setting in your application. Okay. Great. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, we got um, some other questions that, that have come in. And um, one of the things that I think some people are, are particularly interested in is the way in which organizations can, um, can sort of control computing th throughout using, using the mobile uh, and dial-up uh, features. Is there, is there a lot for an organization to learn in this process? I mean, is, is, is it a, a steep learning curve? Um, it r really shouldn't be. I mean, dial-up networking is, is just networking. Uh, so if you've, if you've mastered networking, or, or maybe not mastered, but if you're getting better at networking, because right. it's, it's a pretty, pretty complex area, uh, dial-up networking fits right into it. Uh, the only difference, really the only difference, is now instead of having a net card, you have a modem. Mm -hmm. And we provide a driver that makes your modem look like a net card. Mm -hmm. So all the rules that apply with networking, they apply with dial-up networking. A user really doesn't have to you know, learn something brand new to, to master dial-up networking. It should be a, a pretty quick and easy process. Uh, building on that, Carl from Kansas City had a single word in his question. Security. <laughs> uh, is this safe? Is this safe computer? Sure, sure. Um, Windows 95 doesn't provide file level security the way Windows NT does, and if you have a need for that kind of security, government type security, then you should definitely consider NT. Right. However, from the network point of view, Windows 95 allows you to log into NT domains, for instance, or into a network server. And over dial-up connections, you can do the same kinds of things. And the same kinds of security that exist at the network level are extended out to dial-up networking. So the security is, a, is, is as secure, if not more secure, than the same kind of security you have on your network today. Mm -hmm. and, and at 14.4, is that robust enough for, for, for dial-up networking? Sure. Yeah, yeah, by all means, that's what I use. I have mm -hmm. a portable PC, and uh, Windows 95's dial-up capabilities are designed to make it possible to use those kinds of modems when you're on the road. So, for instance, um, uh, when I do my email, email under Windows 95 has got this remote preview capability, right. so you can do remote mail, and you can download the headers for the messages that are uh -huh. waiting in your inbox, and then choose the important ones mm -hmm. to answer immediately and collect the rest later on when you're at your So I don't office. have to sit through. I, I heard you're a major mail maven. <laughs> 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 that, so you don't have to download the 300 uh, messages. I get a bit of mail. <laughs> right. So, so you can, in a sense, see a table of contents and then go for the stuff. Exactly. Right. Or you can pick the last mail message in a thread and read all the previous responses and choose how to respond to that one mail message. Mm -hmm. so. it, it sounds enormously powerful in that sense. Um, when you put the whole package together and somebody is, is computing from, from their home doing that, what if they have like call waiting? Uh, there, do they, do they do they have to disable call waiting? Oh, it's it's very easy to do that, and uh, for maybe those who don't, who don't know, you you have call waiting, you've had it forever, and now you're just getting into dial-up networking, and you're finding you're getting disconnected from time to time. Mm -hmm. Could be because someone's beeping in, and that's making enough noise on the line that you're losing the connection. Uh, this all goes back to tapping and dialing locations, and one of the things I do is I set up a dialing location from home mm -hmm. or for home. And the only thing I really do is I disable call waiting. And in, in my area, it's just an asterisk 70. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's even provided. I have a drop-down list, and I can select different codes that will disable call waiting. I do that. 
I can make a call. Anybody trying to call in will just get a busy signal, and, and everybody who knows me knows when I, they get that I'm at home and I'm using my computer. Super. Well, we don't want to keep our viewers waiting. Uh, that's all the time that we have for questions during this segment. And one of the things you sometimes wait for in the middle of this is a break. <laughs> and it's here now. We're going to take a 15-minute break now. Remember that you can call 206-635-7066 anytime during today's show. Our Windows 95 engineers are there to answer your questions right now. So please call 206-635-7066 right now. Now we're going to list a number of resources that are available to you to receive up-to-date information on Windows 95. Get your pen and paper ready to copy them down. We'll be back in 15 minutes. If you'd like to subscribe to Microsoft's Win News electronic newsletter, send internet email to enews at microsoft.nwnet.com with the words subscribe Win News as the only text in the body of your message. Win News file sections can also be found on most major online services. and
The transcript, content outline, and PowerPoint slides of this broadcast will be available on CompuServe and the World Wide Web at these addresses. To receive the Microsoft Project Template for deployment of Windows 95, send your name, company name, address, phone, and fax numbers via the Internet to deploy95 at Microsoft.com. The Microsoft Project Template is also available on CompuServe, Go MSTD Forum, Windows 95 Library. The title is Win95P.zip. To receive a beta version of the Windows 95 Resource Kit, or for more information about this kit, call 1-800-315-0676. Inside Windows 95 by Adrian King is available for $24.95 at most major bookstores or by calling 1-800-MS-PRESS. To get a program guide for Microsoft TV with information on business-to-business -business television programs from Microsoft, email us at mstv at microsoft.com or call 1-800-597-3200. For information or to subscribe to Microsoft's TechNet program, call toll-free 1-800-344-2121 or visit your local software reseller. For international availability and pricing, check with your local Microsoft subsidiary. You can also view a subset of TechNet on the World Wide Web at this address. Watch for TechNet on the Microsoft Network, coming soon to a PC near you. To order a videotape of today's program, or any others in the Windows 95 Traincast series, call 1-800-597-3200. We're always anxious to hear your comments on the Windows 95 Traincast series, as well as other programs offered by Microsoft TV. Please contact us via the internet at mstv at microsoft.com or call us toll free at 1-800-597-3200. We'll be back with more of Windows 95 Traincast in a few moments. In the meantime, our Traincast question and answer phone lines are still open. Call area code 206-635-7066. You still have ample opportunity to win a full multimedia computer system from Dell. Just answer this question. Name the feature of Microsoft Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines or servers. Here it is again. Name the feature of Microsoft's Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines or servers. When you have the answer, call toll-free 1-800-254-4069. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
Welcome back to Windows 95 TrainCast, the program designed to prepare you for the move to and implementation of Microsoft's Windows 95. Windows 95 TrainCast is sponsored in part by Dell Computer Corporation. Here's today's question for your chance to win a complete multimedia computer system from Dell. Name the feature of Microsoft's Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines or servers. Call us toll free at 1-800-254-4069 when you have the answer. Once again, here's Elliot Maisie. We're back. I hope that you had a chance to stand up and stretch during the break. Um, if you missed the first half of the show, videotapes of this program and past Windows 95 TrainCast programming are available by calling us at 1-800-597-3200. In this segment, we will hear from both Ben Stewart and Alex Saunders. First, Ben will discuss the dial-up server available in Microsoft Plus. He will also discuss the difference between point-to-point -point and point-to-LAN connections. Alec will then expand on Microsoft Plus by showing some of the features such as the System Agent, Drive Space 3, and the customizable desktop themes. Take it away, Ben. In the previous section, I installed Microsoft Plus and showed some of its enhanced internet features. There is yet another facet of Microsoft Plus that will be of interest to you in regards to remote computing. With Microsoft Plus dial-up networking feature, you can configure a computer running Windows 95 to be a remote access server for dial-up clients running Windows 95, Windows NT, and Windows for Workgroups 311. The Windows 95 dial-up server can act as a NetBIOS gateway or an IPX router to the network, or as a point-to-point -point server to the client, sharing its file and printing resources with one dial-up client at a time. The dial-up networking server component, rnaserve.dll, will not be available in the Windows 95 product. The PPP and RAS dial-up server will be made available in the Microsoft Plus for Windows 95. Now let's start a discussion of the dial-up server. The Windows 95 dial-up networking server provides point-to-point -point and point-to-LAN connectivity to various dial-up networking clients. A point-to-point -point connectivity gives you access to shared resources on the dial-up server. This is the case with the Windows for Workgroups 311 RAS dial-up server, which is available in many online services. A point-to-LAN connection, on the other hand, gives you access to all shared resources on the network. Windows 95 provides point-to-LAN connectivity when you dial in using the RAS or PPP line protocols and the NetBuoy or IPX data protocols. The Windows 95 dial-up networking host server will provide access for the following clients. Windows 95 dial-up networking clients, Windows for Workgroups version 3.1.1 RAS clients, Windows NT version 3.1 RAS clients, Windows NT version 3.5 clients, and other dial-up networking clients using the, utilizing the PPP line protocol. Let's take this opportunity to set up the dial-up server. First of all, you need to make sure you have installed Microsoft Plus. To set up the dial-up server, I'll start by double-clicking on my computer. Then I'll choose dial-up networking. Inside dial-up networking, I need to choose connections and then dial-up server. Here I can allow caller access. Also, if my computer is set up for share level security, I can set up a share level password by clicking on change password and entering in my password. With or without a share level password, any caller can gain access to your dial-up server if they guess the right password. A tighter security model is user level security. Let's take a look at a computer set up for user level security. Here you can see I have basically the same screen. I can allow caller access, but the difference is I can go in and pick and choose which users I want to have access to my dial-up server. Now I can select which users I want to have access and then choose OK. Now only these users can dial in to this dial-up server. 
Also notice on the screen, I can select which modems I want to allow caller access on and allow different users to dial in on different modems. This provides for easier administration since users dialing in remotely will log on with the same accounts and passwords that they use while they're at the office. This ensures that users will have the same privileges and permissions they normally have when using a computer directly connected to the LAN. Now that you've seen how to set up the dial-up server, let's talk about protocols. Unlike the dial-up client, the Windows 95 dial-up networking server only supports two line protocols, RAS and PPP. To configure your dial-up server to only support one line protocol, select the server type by clicking on the server type option, and then drop down this dialog box to explicitly set the line protocol that you want to support. When the server type is set to default, the server and client will automatically negotiate between RAS and PPP. PPP is tried first. If the server type is explicitly set for PPP or RAS, then only that protocol is used for connectivity. The only reason you'd want to explicitly set only one line protocol is if you know that all of your clients will be calling in on that protocol. For example, if you know that all of your clients will be calling in using the RAS line protocol, you can set this protocol as a default and slightly increase your connection speed. Windows 95 dial-up networking client and server both support the same data protocols, IPX SPX, NetBuoy, and TCP IP. It's important to note that when using static IP addresses for both client and the Windows 95 dial-up server, TCP IP will only provide point-to-point -point connectivity. This means you will only see shared resources on the dial-up server instead of the entire network. However, due to the technical administration issues that surround TCP IP, Windows 95 does not support a remote client to use TCP IP when dialing in to a Windows 95 dial-up networking server. This configuration is supported when dialing in to other dial-up servers, such as Windows NT version 3.5. Incoming packets from a remote client will either be NetBuoy, which is submitted to the NetBIOS gateway for a point-to-LAN connection, or IPX, which will be submitted to the IPX router for a point-to-LAN connection. The Windows 95 dial-up networking server employs a NetBIOS gateway for point-to-LAN connectivity for a dial-up networking client. A remote client using NetBuoy can effectively access any NetBIOS-based network resource that would be available from the dial-up networking server. The dial-up networking client using NetBuoy can access any LAN resource available from the dial-up server using NetBuoy. For example, a Windows for Workgroup server using the NetBuoy data protocol. You can see any LAN resources available from the dial-up server using NetBIOS over TCP IP. For example, a Windows 95 server running NetBIOS over TCP IP. And you can access any LAN resource available from the remote access server using NetBIOS over IPX. For example, a Windows NT server running the NetBIOS over IPX protocol. The dial-up networking server employing the NetBIOS gateway has several responsibilities. These include NetBIOS name management. When the initial connection is made between the dial-up networking client and server, the dial-up networking client passes the NetBIOS name and it is added to the NetBIOS name table on the dial-up networking server. The dial-up networking server acts as a proxy for the client on the LAN. The dial-up networking server is also responsible for passing NetBIOS packets from the dial-up networking client to the LAN. When the dial-up networking client sends NetBuoy packets across the phone lines, those packets are submitted to the NetBIOS gateway and sent over a NetBIOS providing protocol, such as NetBuoy, NetBIOS over IPX, and NetBIOS over TCP IP. The dial-up server is also responsible for passing NetBIOS packets from the LAN to the dial-up networking client. 
NetBIOS packets from the LAN addressed to the NetBIOS computer name of the dial-up networking client are picked up by the dial-up networking server and passed to the dial-up networking client using NetBuoy. The Windows 95 networking server also employs an IPX router for packets traveling between the dial-up adapter and LAN adapter, but not between two LAN adapters. This provides point-to-LAN connectivity for a dial-up networking client using IPX. The IPX router of the dial-up networking server, which is built into NW-Link, routes IPX packets just as any IPX router would do. That is, packets destined to a machine on a remote subnet are sent to the router's hardware ID. The router, in this case, the dial-up networking server, looks at the network ID and passes the packet to the dial-up networking client if the network ID matches. The dial-up networking server employing the IPX router also has several responsibilities. These include network ID negotiation. When the initial connection is made, the dial-up networking server passes the IPX network ID to the dial-up networking client. The dial-up networking server is also responsible for passing IPX packets from the dial-up networking client to the LAN. When the dial-up networking client sends IPX packets across the phone line, those packets are routed onto the LAN. And finally, the dial-up server is also responsible for passing IPX packets from the LAN to the dial-up networking client. IPX packets from the LAN are inspected and routed across the phone line to the dial-up networking client. Now that we've talked about the dial-up server, you're probably wondering about security. A common misconception is that if you enable your computer for remote access, any unauthorized caller with a spare two minutes can dial into your system and copy and destroy your data. With Windows 95, this is not the case. There are several levels of authentication and security that the unauthorized caller must penetrate before they can reach vital data. Now let's talk about some of those layers of security. Windows 95 uses different authentication mechanisms that depend on the security model configured on the server. That is, share level or user level, like I showed you earlier. If you're unfamiliar with the security models Windows 95 offers, be sure to view Traincast show number four, Networking. This show is available from Microsoft TV. Now, back to the security issues at hand. The first layer of security is dial-up networking. A dial-in password for share level or a user account for user level may be enabled for access to the dial-up networking server. The second layer is network access. In order to access network resources in a Windows NT domain model or Novell Netware Bindery model, users may have to be validated by a domain controller or a Netware file server when attempting to connect to the LAN. The third layer is local access. The network resource shared on the LAN can be further secured with either a share level password or authorized user account. In this section, I showed you how the Windows 95 dial-up server has been enhanced with the NetBIOS gateway and IPX router to now provide point to LAN connectivity when the client is dialing in using the NetBuoy or IPX data protocols. You saw the two line protocols that are available to the dial-up server, which are PPP and RAS. And most importantly, I discussed what security options are available to the Windows 95 dial-up server and how to configure them when using share level and user level security. In the next section, we'll discuss Microsoft Exchange. I'll discuss the universal inbox concept, and I'll explain how you can download your Microsoft, CompuServe, and internet mail. We will also look at sending and receiving faxes. You will also see how to remotely preview your mail messages and selectively choose which ones you want to download. I'll show you how to configure Microsoft Exchange to use multiple profiles. And lastly, we'll take a quick look at the mail services the Microsoft Network will provide. Thanks, Ben. Having access 
to LAN and all of the goodies that come with it makes mobile computing an extremely productive experience. It's time now for Alec to switch places with Ben to show you what Microsoft Plus can do to make your computing experience, whether mobile or at your desktop, easier and more enjoyable. Alec! Hi folks. Today I'm here to show you Microsoft Plus for Windows 95, the mag wheels and chrome trim for the new Windows. Microsoft Plus is designed to make Windows 95 run better and look better on 486 and Pentium PCs. And Microsoft Plus also makes it convenient and easy to get on the internet with the new Microsoft Internet Jumpstart Kit. Let's start by looking at how Microsoft Plus makes your computer run better. Over here, at the bottom right hand side of the screen on the taskbar, you'll see a new icon. This is the Microsoft Plus System Agent. The system agent is a smart assistant that works in the background to keep your system optimized for top performance. Let's look at how it works. The system agent is a program scheduler with a subtle difference. It can schedule activities to occur during idle time. When you're not using your computer, the system agent compresses data to free up hard disk space and cleans up your hard disk correcting any disk errors and defragmenting the hard disk. All of these things keep your computer running at peak performance and are part of the regular recommended care and feeding of a computer, but are things that many of us neglect or rely on others to do for us. The Microsoft Plus system agent and utilities are flexible. You can choose to have the system agent run system maintenance task at tasks at regularly scheduled times or during system idle time. Because the system agent knows when you aren't using the PC, your PC can t maintain itself while you're in a meeting or going to lunch. Let's have a look at how it works. We'll schedule a new task with the system agent right now. To schedule a task, I go and choose Program and schedule a new program from this menu. Then I select the program that I want to run. I could type in any that I wanted here, but the system agent knows about several that I might want to. For instance, I can choose the disk defragmenter. And then I can go over here and choose when I want to run this. I can, if you'll notice, you can choose a number of different settings. You can say once, or hourly, or daily, weekly, monthly at startup or whenever the system is idle. Well, I'm going to choose to defrag my, my disk weekly. In fact, I'm going to do it every Monday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And just in case I'm using my computer at the time, I'll tell the computer to wait until I haven't used it for 10 minutes. And that's all there is to it. Microsoft Plus also ships with two new compression utilities, DriveSpace 3 and a utility called the Compression Agent. DriveSpace 3 is an enhanced version of the DriveSpace disk compression which ships with Windows 95. It supports large compressed volumes up to 2 gigabytes and greater disk compression ratios. Let's have a look at how it affects your drive. If I click on my computer here, I have another disk drive down here labeled E, which is compressed. Right clicking on that allows me to bring up properties on the E drive. Now the E drive is a small compressed volume which I've created here to demonstrate how the new disk compression in Microsoft Plus works. First, let's take a look at the Compression Properties tab for this drive. Notice that DriveSpace 3 supports three different compression levels, Ultra Pack, High Pack, and Standard Compression. Ultra Pack compression gives you the most compression, but is also the slowest to read and write compressed files. High Pack gives you very high compression compared to DriveSpace in Windows 95, and it reads at about the same speed as DriveSpace does, but it writes a little bit slower. Standard compressed files are the same ones, uh, gives you the same compression ratio as you find with Windows 95. Notice also down at the bottom here, there's another item called reduced overhead. Reduced overhead refers to the fact that DriveSpace 3 is capable of writing files into individual sectors on the disk as opposed to clusters. Now a cluster in this case is 32K of disk space. And the way that the FAT file system works is it stores an individual file one per cluster. DriveSpace 3 allows you to store them one per sector, and there are 64 sectors inside of each cluster. So you can see that there can be a substantial improvement in disk space, and in this case with my little 50 meg disk that I've created here, I've gained back 8.6 megabytes of space due to reduced overhead. Compression is flexible with DriveSpace 3 and Microsoft Plus, allowing you to trade off between maximum performance and maximum disk space, or some combination of the two of them. Now, let's have a look at the Compression Agent. The Compression Agent is an intelligent offline compression utility for DriveSpace 3 that automatically chooses the best compression algorithm for each file on your system and delivers exceptional compression of your data. To get to the Compression Agent, 
I click on the Start button and choose the compression agent from the system menu. First it asks me which drive I want to work with. I click on OK for the E drive. Then I can choose settings to specify how I want this compression agent to work. The compression agent can be set to maximally compress files which you don't use often and to not compress files which are used frequently. This gives you maximum disk space with the minimum impact from disk compression. In this case, the compression agent is only going to ultra-pack files which are older than 30 days. The reason for doing this is because ultra-pack is the slowest of all of our compression algorithms. And it's going to turn around and high-pack all of the remaining files. I'm going to do that because high-pack reads back at the same rate as standard disk compression and it writes a little bit slower. So I can take advantage of the fact that the compression agent works offline to give myself the maximum compression on files that I use normally. So to summarize, Microsoft Plus makes your system run better by making it self-maintaining and by compressing your data when you're away from your PC for maximum performance. Now, if you've played with the Windows 95 desktop even a little bit, you'll know that it's almost infinitely customizable. You can make it look just about any way you like. Microsoft Plus introduces desktop themes to Windows 95. Each desktop theme incorporates sounds and fonts and colors and schemes, wallpapers, screensavers, new icons, animated cursors. You can coordinate and switch easily among all of these elements, adding fun and variety to your computing experience. Let's see how it works. If I go down to the Start button and choose Settings, go to the Control Panel, you'll see that we've added a little desktop themes applet here in the Control Panel. Double-clicking it brings up the Theme Selector. And I can choose from any of 11 different themes that Microsoft Plus has implemented. Now these themes have been designed by the same user interface designers that designed the Windows 95 user interface. And each one of these themes sets over 80 different system parameters. So we can just go through them all one at a time and you can see what they look like. For instance, here's the Dangerous Creatures theme. You can see right away that we have changed the system icons. We have got a new bitmap. We've also got new pointers and sounds. There's a theme for inside your computer. Notice that this one is a high color theme versus a 256 color theme. In keeping with the notion that Microsoft Plus is a product which targets PCs with more capabilities, some of these themes are designed to work on systems with high color video cards that support 65,000 or 17 million colors. And some of them are also designed to work on systems that support 800 by 600 video graphics instead of 640 by 480. And there are a number of different ones that we can work with. There's Leonardo da Vinci. There's um, a mystery theme for mystery buffs. There's uh, a nature one for nature buffs. There's a theme here for, for, for people who are budding scientists and a sports theme and a 60s theme for the deadhead and all of us. Uh, one which is called the Golden Era, which is all about the 40s and 50s. And there's a travel theme and there's a Microsoft Windows 95 theme. Why don't I just go ahead and pick one of these and we'll continue to work with that. My personal favorite is the 60s, so we'll go with that one and I simply click on OK over here to set up my PC and you can see right away that it has a substantial impact on the way that the PC looks. Another visual feature in Microsoft Plus for Windows 95 is a thing called font smoothing. Font smoothing allows fonts to be shown on screen smoothed. That is that they are hinted and anti-aliased so they appear to be smooth on the screen instead of jagged. We also include another visual feature called Full Windows Drag, which you can see pretty easily. If I just double click on this window here, I can drag it around on the screen. Now, you say to yourself, why would this be an interesting feature? It seems pretty gratuitous, until you do something like this. Resizing a window, and you get to immediately see the scroll bars as they appear. If you've ever spent any time at all sizing two windows to be exactly the size that you want them, and then let go of the button in Windows and had the scroll bars pop in, you'll appreciate this feature. And finally, for the visual portion of this, what product would be complete without a game? Well, Microsoft Plus is no exception. It has a new 3D pinball game for Windows 95. If I go down here to the game select section, you can see exactly what I mean. Now, I'll bet you've never seen a Windows-based game like this one before. First of all, check out the smooth motion. And 
the flawless animation. That's because 3D Pinball uses a new dib section game programming API in Windows 95. It's authentic. The sounds are authentic because they were recorded in actual arcades. The flipper lengths are all authentic. Plays like a dream for pinball lovers. Anyway, let's put that aside for the minute. Okay, so now you've seen how Microsoft Plus makes your PC look better. The desktop themes enhance the appearance of your PC. Full window drag makes it easy to resize windows. Font smoothing makes it easy to look at the type, makes the type look better, and you get a great new game. Now let's talk about the Microsoft Plus Internet Jumpstart Kit. The Internet Jumpstart Kit makes it easy and convenient and inexpensive to get on the information highway today. Microsoft Plus includes a setup wizard to help with signing up with an internet service provider. The Internet Explorer, which is Microsoft's Windows 95 based worldwide web browser, and an internet mail reader for the Windows 95 Exchange mail client. In addition, Microsoft Plus customers receive an extra month of free time surfing the net on the Microsoft network. Now, Ben has shown you earlier how easy it is to sign up for the internet with, with Microsoft Plus and the Microsoft network, so I won't show you that. But let's have a look at the Internet Explorer, which is Microsoft's worldwide web browser that was created specifically for Windows 95. It has a couple of unique features that you'll want to know about. Let's start the Internet Explorer now. First of all, with the Internet Explorer, you don't need to know what kind of server you're hitting out there on the net. You don't need to know whether or not it's an FTP server or a World Wide Web server or a Gopher server. The Internet Explorer makes an intelligent guess about what kind of server you're trying to reach and chooses the appropriate pro protocol. Watch. If I go up here and type in worldwideweb.microsoft.com, Internet Explorer knows that that was a World Wide website. Notice also that I haven't actually made a connection to the Internet yet. Now, the Internet Explorer includes a persistent cache that sits on your disk from one session to the next. Earlier today, I had already connected up to Microsoft's World Wide Web server. And because I haven't made a connection to the Internet yet, the World Wide Web server, or the Internet Explorer, simply fetched the data that I had looked at before. Very convenient, for instance, if you're surfing the web and you're sitting on an airplane. Let's try a site that I haven't tried yet today. Let's try, for instance, um, Time's Pathfinder site. The first thing you'll see is that Microsoft, uh, the Internet Explorer pops up a window asking me to make a connection to the Internet. And I'll go and make my connection through the Microsoft network. Now, the Internet Explorer is dialing to the Microsoft network, to the Microsoft network's global TCP IP network. Okay, Internet Explorer has finished downloading Time's Pathfinder page. This is an interesting page because Time Magazine lets me read all of their magazine content online from here. I might want to add this particular page to my favorites. So I go up here and I select Favorites and Add to Favorites. And it will pop up a dialog and ask me what I want to call this. And I'll just say 
Time Warner Pathfinder and click Add and it gets added to my favorites list. The next time I go to select from that menu I'll see Time Warner Pathfinder. I might also want to make a shortcut to this particular site. Microsoft Plus extends the Windows 95 shortcut functionality so that customers will be able to create shortcuts to favorite internet locations and then reach these locations with a single mouse click. To create a shortcut, I simply go over to File and choose Create Shortcut. Explorer tells me that there will be a shortcut to the current page placed on my desktop, and I click on OK. And if I minimize this page, you can see that there is this shortcut to the Pathfinder. Actually, I can go ahead and close this, and um, MSN will ask me if I want to disconnect, so I say yes, and it will disconnect from the network. The next time I want to use that page, I can simply double click on it and it will behave like any other shortcut in Windows 95. This has some interesting implications. I can do things like, for instance, mail this shortcut to somebody else so that they can look at this page if they want to. Or I can store the shortcut in a directory somewhere. And actually, the Internet Explorer's favorites storage mechanism is to store the shortcuts in um, I store favorites as shortcuts in a directory and I can go ahead and create subdirectories of these shortcuts and I can build trees of them and uh, share them with other folks and create cascading menus from them and all the things that you'd be able to do with a file in Windows 95. So this is a very flexible and an efficient way um, to manage favorite sites on the internet. Another capability which the Internet Explorer supports is object linking and embedding. For instance, I can drag and drop a graphic from a web page onto my desktop. Here's how. If I grab the drag graphic like this and drag it out onto the desktop, I got a GIF file created from that web page on the desktop. Okay, let's return to how it is that the Microsoft Network and the Internet Explorer interact together because there's some interesting things that you can do there. First of all, if I start the Microsoft Network, I'm going to start up a TCP IP network connection here. And the Internet Explorer and the Microsoft Network will both share that TCP IP connection. Now the fact that this is a shared TCP IP connection makes some thing, interesting things possible. For instance, Microsoft Network content which is considerably richer than most of the content on the network, can now be delivered to Internet customers. Let's have a look at my favorite places on the Microsoft network as an example. If I click on Favorite Places, you'll see an icon which says Microsoft Encarta Intro Edition. Now this is an online version of Microsoft's Encarta Encyclopedia, which is normally delivered on CD-ROM. So if I click on this to open it up, we can have a look at it. And you can see what I mean by the rich content which is available on the Microsoft network versus that content which is normally available on the internet. Here's the splash screen. I'll click on enter to get into Encarta. And it'll take a second while it brings up the first article. And here's Encarta. You can see that it looks quite a bit like the PC edition of Encarta. So if I go up here and click on Find, for instance, I can bring up a list of topics and look for something. I'm going to San Francisco next week, so why don't I have a look at what Encarta has about San Francisco in its database. And I'll go ahead and click to find out what's there. Now, bear in mind that the content which is being delivered here is being delivered over a 14.4 modem, which is a pretty ordinary modem. And this is the kind of content that you would normally expect to find on a CD-ROM. And there's my article on San Francisco. The Microsoft Network also provides complete access to internet news groups. It also provides access to internet mail. 
And in addition to that, you can use the Internet Explorer from the Microsoft Network. So for instance, as I said earlier, the two, the Internet Explorer and the Microsoft Network, share the same TCP IP connection. Now, to quickly recap, Microsoft Plus makes your Windows 95 PC run better and look better, and it includes the Microsoft Internet Jumpstart Kit as an added bonus. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alec. Why don't you join Ben and me for some more viewer questions? The Windows 95 engineers will continue to take calls throughout the show. Before we get started, let's hear that question again. Name the feature of Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines on file servers. Just call and answer the question. Now, there just may be a free Microsoft Encarta CD in it for you. Everyone that calls will get a shot at that Dell computer drawing on the last show. The number again is 1-800-254-4069. Now, time now to answer your questions. And if you haven't been paying attention, you might want to just think about uh, what would you, uh, it could be leather, it could have a snap on it, and you might take it to work with some papers, but there could be a digital version of it. We call this uh, a trainer's assistance there. So if you, <laughs> so think about it. I want you to win that, that Encarta and, uh, and Dell gift. Uh, the, um, Alec, the, uh, the demo on, on Plus seemed fascinating. Uh, and uh, it, it seems very, very robust. And I mean, how do you, how do you see, a user using it? In other words, is, is it something that I'll go and I'll buy Windows 95 and then I'll go buy, buy Plus to kind of soup up my machine in that sure. sense? Yeah, you'll see them side by side on the shelf when you buy Windows 95. And if you need those capabilities or you want them, just pick them up and go with them. And I mean, once you get it home installed on your PC, you'll be able to you know, make your PC more self-maintaining. You'll be able to use those cool desktop themes. Mm -hmm. you know, the 60s one, that one's yeah, just Yeah, I, cool. I, 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 <laughs> I wanted to twist the sister one that's in yeah, version that's right. 2 of the desktop. Uh, it seems in many ways it, it, it's part of the whole concept now in technology of, of personalization of being able to personalize that environment. In Very much way. so. I mean, we all want to humanize our PCs and make them be the, you know, uh, more like ourselves and reflect our personalities more, and that's what Plus is all about, Microsoft mm -hmm. Plus. And, and super. Uh, well, we, we, we stimulated a lot of uh, interest amongst our viewers, uh, and particularly as we started to talk about compression. And we, mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got a call here. Uh, Daniel Miller is on the line live from Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, Daniel, are you there? Yes, I'm sure here. Ah, well, thank you for calling, uh, Daniel. Um, I, you had a, a question for our crew here about about double space. Yes, uh, I have a big question about it. I'm currently running DOS 6.2, and I was wondering, uh, do you have to remove the double space from DOS 6.2 in order to uh, use the disk and uh, file compression on that new uh, software you're talking about? Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. I can answer that one for you, Daniel. Um, absolutely not is the short answer. Uh, the compression that comes with Microsoft Plus is an upgrade to the compression that you will get to the MS-DOS 6.2 compression and also to the compression that comes with Windows 95. So Windows 95 supports compression already. The good news is even if you just choose to go with the Windows 95 compression, what you're getting is 32-bit protect mode compression, so it's faster and it's more robust. And plus, when you go to Microsoft Plus, then you get the added advantage of being able to support large volumes. You get the uh, uh, compression agent features and that kind of stuff as well. So we've tried to make it possible for you to go from one compression all the way up to our top-of-the-line compression without having any pain at all. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, a couple of other questions uh, came in, and we have one from uh, Gail in Reston, Virginia. Uh, she wanted to know, can I have two Tapi-aware applications such mm -hmm. as fax and dial-up networking in auto-answer mode at the same time? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, with this release of Windows 95, you can't. Although it is possible to have both of those applications running at the same time, you know, with one actually working on the phone line, the other one just sitting there, uh, it's not possible to have two of those applications waiting for a call and then negotiate which one gets that. Maybe we'll see that in a, in a future release. Okay. Talking about future releases, um, we had a, a, a number of people call up and asked about infrared communications. Uh, they come off the road and, and, and they're real excited about being able to point their laptop mm -hmm. at a device mm -hmm. and print. Uh, could you maybe explain a little bit about 
about what that is, and I, I know that, that, that there's some work underway on, on sure. infrared. Yeah. There's a new generation of PC hardware coming that communicates via infrared, the same kind of technology that you use to be able to point and click with your VCR and your TV. And uh, PCs are now starting to arrive, portable PCs with infrared components built into them. There'll be a little infrared uh, beamer unit on the, on the PC itself, and then there'll be what we call a dongle hanging off your main PC. And that's just an infrared eye that allows you to transmit data back and forth okay. between the two of them. How, how do you spell dongle? <laughs> D-O-N-G-L-E. Check in your spell checker, dongle. Dongle, that's You right. heard it here yeah. first. That, right. In any case, um, Windows 95 immediately, when it ships, won't support that stuff. But within 60 days of Windows 95 shipping, we will be shipping um, upgrades that will allow you to be able to do that in one of a number of different possible packages. We haven't decided how this will happen quite yet, but mm. we know that there will be a tune-up kits and those sorts of things coming after Windows 95 that ships that will support those infrared components. Well, I, I got a great phrase for you to use. You're a marketing person. Aim and play. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, aim and play. That's it's a great be, one. Beyond plug and plug and play. I know there's actually a lot of interest in, in, in infrared uh, communications. Uh, I know when I visit offices, they always get nervous when I say, "Can I unhook your printer so that I can I can uh, print there?" And so well, I mean, there's there's that issue, and the fact that it's just simply a lot easier for yeah. the customer to be able to sit down and point the PC at the at the you know device that they want to communicate with, and 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 go from there. So essentially, it seems a lot of the focus, and I know our show today has been about sort of breaking that physical cement handcuff that you have between you and the PC mm -hmm. right. and instead being able to move anywhere right. and, and, and compute from, right. from, from anywhere. Um, one of the things that, that people are, are interested in is, is remote mail in mm -hmm. Windows 95. And we had a question uh, from Doug in Austin about, does Doug need to set up a special server to use remote mail in Windows 95? Uh, good question. Uh, no, you would just need to use a, a regular Windows uh, for Workgroup 311, Workgroup Post Office, a shared file post office would work fine. We're completely backwards compatible with those. Mm -hmm. That's right. Windows 95 has built-in support for uh, remote mail. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that there's often been some thought about where mail is located in, in that sense. So, so mail will now, in a sense, be a combination of, of what happens on your server and what you have in Windows 95 as a client. Right, right. Yeah. That's correct. You'll have your mail come into the post office and then your client will collect the mail from the post office at some later time when you tell it to or when you're ho physically hooked up to your network or mm -hmm. you know you use remote mail to fetch the mail, that kind of thing. Right. And then just like Alec mentioned a, a moment ago, uh, instead of having to make the connection and download all of your mail, which as we know, you, you get a little bit of junk you yeah. know, with your, with your mail every day. You're kidding. Yeah. And, and when you're on a, a dial-up connection, it's not going to be as fast as if you're physically connected to your network. So we, we allow remote preview and you can just select the pieces of mail that you want to download and just download those and leave the rest for when you're back at your office and you're physically connected. Now I know as a trainer there's just this enormous installed base of people who are using MS Mail. Uh, essentially, will, will this be familiar to them as they move into, into Windows 95? Is, is there a real, is a real flow of, of, of feature compatibility there? Yeah, there sure is. And in fact, uh, with, with, with the new mail client that we have, uh, with Windows 95 that's completely compatible with the uh, with the post office from work groups, uh, it it makes sense to use it. it. It's just so much more intuitive. In fact, now we can support different colors and graphics and things like that that weren't previously available. So we don't have to ship our whole enterprises back to the classroom. No, no, absolutely that. not. Okay, um, we have a couple of other questions. Uh, how can I tell if the dial-up server is installed on my machine? Okay, good question too. Uh, there's there's a couple of real quick and easy ways you can check and see if the dial-up server is installed. Uh, if you know maybe you got a machine that you don't know you know who set it up or whatever. One way is to go into my computer and dial-up networking. Under the connection option, you'll see an option for dial-up server. That's the easiest way through the Windows 95 user interface. Another way is to look for the existence of a file called rnaserve.dll in your Windows system directory. If either of those are true, then then you've got it installed. Mm -hmm. um, if, if a user is out there and doesn't have a dock replicator, you know, they don't have a, port, a docking station or a port replicator, uh, can they, can, you know, 
Does their value go down? Are there still some options that are open to them? Sure. Windows 95 supports, for instance, the new small form factor PC cards. Mm -hmm. It allows for dial-up networking, so you don't actually have to be connected up to a port replicator. The briefcase has fantastic functionality. There's all kinds of benefits to using Windows 95 in a mobile computing environment without actually having to use a port replicator or a docking station as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the, the there, there's a, a utility within Windows 95 that allows me to, to hook a cable if I don't have a network at home? Yeah. Right. Can you explain that and, and what that's Direct about? Direct Cable Connect. Um, basically, you're, you've got a cable that you connect up the two piece, PCs together with, and what you end up with is uh, a small network, in mm, essence. Right. We're connecting to the two PCs together, and you can share files across them. You can share devices like printers and faxes. You can um, uh, uh, transfer files back and forth. You know, all kinds of good things like that. And, and that is that like a standard homegrown cable? Or is it just one that would have? A, is it a parallel would, or serial? You would need like a, either or a parallel or a serial cable, just a null modem type cable or lap link cables would work great. Mm -hmm. And what's the, and is it a pretty fast rate between them? Well, the the parallel would be faster. Um, it's it's a serial rate. Uh, it's 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 decent. Mm -hmm. You can actually you can actually be productive with it. Okay. We have a call from Karen up in Anchorage, Alaska, which mm -hmm. is uh, exciting for some of our our, our, our northern viewers. Uh, Karen's got a problem. So you call the right place, Karen. Um, she's unable to connect to a Windows 95 dial-up networking server while running a Windows for Workgroups remote access server, an RAS client, Windows NT 3.1 client, or Windows dial-up networking client. So mm. uh, can, you, can you help our, our friend from the most northern part of the United States? Well, I, I, I can share a couple of thoughts. Um, one, it, it sounds like you're dialing into a Windows 95 machine with a, with a RAS client. Uh, and although that's completely supported because our dial-up server supports both PPP and RAS uh, clients, the thing that you've got to watch out for is something new to Windows 95 that you learned about in the last show is we provide, uh, a, 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 we provide file and printer sharing for NetWare networks. And if you have that installed, you need to dial in with a PPP client instead of a RAS client. Uh, the only other solution to that would be to go to your Windows 95 dial-in server and set up the file and print sharing for Microsoft networks. Well, thank you very much, Ben and Alec, and we'll have one more round of, of questioning. That's all the time we have for this question and answer period. Ben's heading over to our TrainCast workstation, and we'll get on with the show. Just a reminder that our TrainCast question and answer phone lines will remain open till the end of this show. So once again, the number is 206-635-7066. And maybe we'll use your question in the final question and answer section of the show. Okay, Ben, it's all yours. Microsoft Exchange is a universal messaging client that will allow you to receive your mail from various locations, including many of the popular online services. Exchange provides a centralized location for you to receive all of your mail, as well as faxes. For example, instead of having to keep several applications on your computer, one to download your copies of mail, one to download your internet mail, and another to send and receive faxes, you now only need one application to accomplish these tasks, Microsoft Exchange. Microsoft Exchange client capabilities were created with the mobile user in mind. Exchange captures two areas that make it an excellent application to have on the road. Microsoft Exchange is dial-up networking aware. This means the Microsoft Exchange client can run on a remote machine using dial-up networking to access an inbox that is located on a server. Microsoft Exchange also provides for remote preview. If you're checking mail over a dial-up networking, you won't have to download each new message in its entirety, which, as you know, can be an extremely slow process. Instead, the Microsoft Exchange client allows you to view the subject line of each new message before choosing which specific message to download to your system. As you can probably guess, this greatly enhances your system performance. Before you can use Microsoft Exchange, you must create a profile. A profile contains configuration information, such as the location of your incoming mail, your personal address book, and other information services that are available to you. An information service controls how your messaging applications address, send, receive, and store messages and files. Examples of information services include Microsoft Mail, CompuServe Mail, and Internet Mail, as well as Microsoft Fax. When you want to use a new information service, you must first install it, then add it to your profile.
Let's take this opportunity to install the Microsoft Mail client. To do this, I'll start by double clicking on my control panel icon and then double clicking on the mail and fax icon. To see the profiles that I already have installed, I'll click on show profiles. You can see that I have internet mail settings set up. This was set up for me by the internet install wizard from Microsoft Plus. What I'll do now is add to this existing profile. To do that, I'll choose properties and then add. Now I'll check the information service that I want to add, which is Microsoft Mail. Then choose OK. Now I need to fill out some information. First, I'll enter in the location of my post office. And since this is a portable computer not connected to my physical network, I'll select Use dial-up networking when I start the connection. Since this is a remote configuration, I'll click on the remote configuration tab and make sure that remote mail is selected. The last thing I need to do is click on my logon tab and enter in my mailbox name and my password. This will be set up for you by your network administrator, so if you have any problems logging in, make sure you contact them first. That's all I have to do. The rest of the settings can be left at their default. Now I'll choose OK, OK again, and then close. Now Microsoft Mail is set up and I can download some mail. To use Remote Preview to check our Microsoft Mail, we start by double clicking on the inbox icon that's on our desktop. This will launch Microsoft Exchange. Now to get our mail, we choose Tools, Deliver Now Using, and select Microsoft Mail. The next screen that will come up will allow us to select which connection we want to use to connect to our post office that's up on a network server. I'll choose my corporate network connection and then choose OK. Okay, now I'm connected, and now I have to enter in my mailbox name and enter in my password, and then choose OK. And there you have it. Microsoft Exchange dialed into a Windows 95 server which had my post office, downloaded my mail, and then disconnected. This greatly decreases the amount of time it takes to download your messages. The Microsoft Exchange client also provides a consistent user interface for accessing CompuServe mail. It does not, however, provide for access to any other CompuServe services or forum mail. Support for CompuServe Mail is important because it is used by a wide range of users and companies for electronic mail. With the Exchange Client Provider that ships with Windows 95, you can integrate your CompuServe Mail messages with messages from other mail systems, such as Internet Mail, Microsoft Mail, as well as other clients that are supported by Exchange. Many of you will have been using CompuServe prior to configuring the CompuServe Client for Microsoft Exchange. There are many ways to access CompuServe Mail. One of them being WinSim, which is CompuServe's Windows-based user interface. The CompuServe mail client will use the WinSim configuration file cis.ini if one exists. This file stores the personal configuration information including your username, your password, and your CompuServe access number. If you have not previously used a CompuServe access program, you'll need to make sure you can log on to CompuServe and access mail prior to setting up the Exchange CompuServe client. This is to ensure that there are no problems with access to your CompuServe account. Just a moment ago, I showed you how to set up the MS Mail client. Now we'll go back and set up the CompuServe client. From the control panel, 
I'll double click on the mail and fax icon. In this example, I'd like to show you how to create a new profile. To do that, I'll click on Show Profiles, then click on Add. Now I'll deselect everything but CompuServe, and then choose Next. Now I can give my profile a name. I'll call it CompuServe Settings, and then choose Next. Now Exchange is looking for a CIS.ini file. With this file, it will automatically configure all of my CompuServe settings for me. If you don't have this file, that's okay. Simply click on Next, and then you can enter in your CompuServe settings manually. I'll go ahead and do that now. And with that complete, I'll choose Next. Now I have a few other settings, Create Session Activity, Delete Retrieved Messages, and Accept Postage Due Messages. I'll select Next. Now Exchange wants to know which personal address book I want to use. I'll use the same one that I've been using for my other mail clients. And now Exchange wants to know which personal information store to use. This is where all of your mail messages are contained. I'll use the same one that I'm using with my other clients. Choose Next. Now it's asking me if I want to put the inbox in the startup group. What this will do is whenever I start Windows 95, it will automatically launch Exchange for me. I'll leave it to No and select Next. Now I'm finished. With that, I'll choose Close. And now I'm ready to download my CompuServe mail. Now that we've created another profile for CompuServe mail, let's try it out. To do this, I'll start by double clicking on the inbox icon on my desktop. This will launch Microsoft Exchange. Now, to download my CompuServe mail, I choose Tools and Deliver Now. Notice in the background, it's connecting to my local CompuServe access number and dialing. Now it's connecting to CompuServe, logging on, accessing my mailbox, and downloading my mail. Now it's disconnected, and I have all my CompuServe mail in my inbox. There is one thing you'll need to watch out for. If both WinSIM and Exchange use the same CIS.ini file, the connector type will have to be changed each time WinSIM is run. This entry is stored in the following location in the CIS.ini file. Connector, port ID equals TAPI. WinSIM doesn't recognize a TAPI entry. You'll need to replace TAPI with the COM port your modem is on. My advice would be to maintain separate CIS.ini files for Exchange and WinSIM. Another service provider that is available for Windows 95 Exchange is the Internet Mail service provider. Internet Mail will ship with the Windows 95 package, but will require a manual setup. Microsoft Plus will provide an Internet Setup Wizard that will facilitate the setup of the Internet Mail client. To use Internet Mail, you'll need to have an Internet Mail account with an Internet Service Provider, such as the Microsoft Network, America Online, or any other dedicated internet service provider, or an internet mail server on your network. If you're already receiving internet mail through another application, make sure that you can access your internet mail provider and read mail prior to configuring the exchange provider. This step is important, especially when accessing mail through a dial-up connection. The following demonstration shows the internet mail configuration settings. 
As you recall, earlier in the show, I installed Plus for Windows 95 and went through the Internet Connectivity Wizard. The Internet Wizard did two things for me. It set up my dial-up connection to my Internet Service Provider and it set up the Exchange to download my Internet Mail. Let's take this opportunity to download my Internet Mail using Exchange. To do this, I simply click on the Inbox icon on my desktop, Start Exchange, Okay. Now Exchange will dial up my internet service provider. Okay. Now I'll log in. Select enter. And then choose continue. Okay. And now you can see it's starting to download my internet mail into my inbox. Okay, and that's really all there is to it. Now that we've seen internet mail in action, let's talk about Microsoft Fax. Microsoft Fax version 2.0 is an enhancement of PC Fax version 1.0 that is currently available in Windows 4 Workgroups version 3.1.1. Messages sent through the MS Fax client to other MS Fax clients can be sent either as faxes or electronic mail, depending on the type of modem receiving the transmission. For example, if I'm using Windows 95 or Windows 4 Workgroups 3.1.1 with fax enabled and I have a class 1 fax modem, I'll be able to send you a fax in mail format as long as we share the same configuration. Messages sent to and from dedicated fax machines can only be sent in fax format instead of an editable format. So, if you send a fax from a dedicated fax machine, I will receive it in an uneditable format. Some of the new fax features include support for V17 fax modems. Microsoft Fax for Windows 95 fully supports V17 fax modems. These fax modems are capable of transmitting fax data at 14.4 bits per second. We also have a cover page editor. This feature can be accessed from the basic tab in the Microsoft Fax property sheet. This applet allows you to create custom cover pages using both graphic and text images. Windows 95 includes four default cover pages, all of which can be customized. We can also view faxes using Windows 95's viewer. The MS Fax Viewer allows you to view, scale, rotate, and page through the fax document as well as printing, deleting, and copying the image to the clipboard. The MS Fax Viewer will also allow you to send, reply to, and forward the current message to others. Another enhanced feature is Enhanced Security. This allows you to send and receive faxes using encryption or a digital signature. This keeps unauthorized persons from being able to view your fax message. Another feature is the utilization of TAPI, the Telephony API. Microsoft Fax 2.0 is a TAPI compliant application, which gives you the ability to specify different calling schemes based upon your current location. It also allows MS Fax to share the communications port with other applications, such as dial-up networking as long as only one application is set in answer mode. Lastly, utilization of unimodem services. This allows modem manufacturers to use a common modem driver, such as unidriver.dll, which is used with printers. Using the services of unimodem, 
MS Fax can support a larger number of modems. It's very important to point out that Windows 95 only supports two classes of fax modems, Class 1 and Class 2. If you're unsure of what type of modem you have, refer to your modem documentation. Now let's take a moment to enable and send a fax under Windows 95. To enable fax support, the first thing I'll do is close down my inbox, then select Control Panel. Okay. Inside Control Panel, I'll double click on Mail and Fax. Next, I'll add the Fax client to my existing profile. To do this, I'll click on Add, select Microsoft Fax, then select OK. Next, it's letting me know that I'm going to have to enter in some more information before I'm done. So let me go ahead and do that. Enter in my name, which is already in there by default, my fax number, and then any other information that I want to have on my fax. Okay. Next, it's going to need to know what type of fax modem I'm going to be using. I'll select my PCMCIA Zoom 14.4 fax modem, set it as my active fax, then select OK. And now I'm done. Choose OK. Now I'm ready to receive a fax. To demonstrate fax, I'll send a fax from this Dell desktop over here to this Dell portable. To create a new fax, I simply click on Compose and then New Fax. This will start my Compose New Fax wizard. First thing I need to do is set my dialing location, then choose Next, and now fill out the information of who I want to send the fax to. And then their fax number. then I can add them to the list. If I wanted to send this fax to several people, I would just add other people to the my recipient list. Now I'll choose Next. Here I can specify a cover page that I want to use. I'll select Urgent, choose Next, and now type the subject of the fax. Okay, and then I could put a note on the cover page if I wanted to. Select Next, and now I can add a file to this fax. To do this, I'll click on Add File, and then search on my hard drive for the file I want to send. I'll double click on my computer, my C drive, the directory I want to use, and then the file I want to use. Then choose Next, and that's all I have to do. Now to send my fax, all I have to do is click Finish. Microsoft Exchange will initialize my modem, prepare the fax, and then fax it to my recipient. Okay, now my fax has been sent. To see this, let's go back to my other machine. Okay, I'll look in my inbox, and there we have it, the fax that was sent from this other computer. 
Lastly, let's take a look at mail support on MSN, the Microsoft Network. MSN is the Microsoft Online Network that will be available at the time Windows 95 releases. MSN will provide several online services, such as online help for a number of Microsoft products, internet access, online multimedia libraries, mail support, and much more. Let's take a look at MSN. To start MSN, simply double click on the Microsoft Network icon on your desktop. Enter in your member ID and your password. Then choose Connect. Now that I've successfully connected to the Microsoft Network, it's letting me know that I have mail waiting for me. At this point, I can start downloading my mail. That'll start Microsoft Exchange. If you don't have an MSN icon on your desktop, you can add one by going to Add Remove Software in Control Panel, then choosing the Windows Setup tab. In this final segment, Exchange, I discuss the five clients that will be available for Exchange. MS Mail, CompuServe Mail, Internet Mail, Microsoft Fax, and MSN Mail. I explain the concept of the Universal Inbox and how it allows you to keep all of your mail in one location instead of spread out from application to application. You saw Exchange profiles and the flexibility they provide by allowing you to have several information services or clients. I explained how to set up the MS Mail client and how to remotely download your mail allowing you to pick and choose what messages you wanted, which will save you time and effort. I discussed how to download your CompuServe mail and what challenges you could have with your CIS.ini file. I discussed how to quickly download your internet mail and how to send and receive faxes. And lastly, we took a quick look at MSN, the Microsoft Network, and the mail services it'll provide. I hope that you've enjoyed this session of TrainCast on remote connectivity and hope that you're successful when you start your deployment of Windows 95. Thanks, Ben. Why don't you join Alec and I for our last round of questions and answers? By the way, good, real good job. You've Thanks. been on your feet Thanks a lot, a lot today. Um, <clears throat> we want to thank those of you that have called in. We have a, a number of your questions I'm going to get to in a moment. I'm sure that there are other viewers who've had the same questions. The Windows 95 engineers have been very busy and have sent us some more questions. But before we get to your questions, <clears throat> let's hear that contest question one more time. Name that feature in Windows 95 that allows you to synchronize data between your portable computer and your desktop machines or file servers. 100 names will be drawn from the correct answers to receive a copy of Microsoft Encarta. Everyone that calls will have their name entered into the grand prize drawing for a chance to win a new multimedia computer system provided by Dell Computer Corporation. What's that number? Say it with me now, 1-800-254-4069 to answer the question for your chance to win. Now, let's hear some of your questions. Alec and Ben, ready for the last, last round? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, well, we've literally been flooded with an, a number of questions. Uh, and uh, since you've been talking, um, let me start with Alec. Uh, Ken Feldman from Pennsylvania wanted mm -hmm. to know, Ken said, um, to get out to the internet, they have to go through a firewall. Does web browser support this functionality? Sure. Um, to answer the question, Ken, there's a couple of different kinds of firewall strategies that are in place for companies today on the internet. And 
The Internet Explorer supports the most common strategy, which at this point is a thing called a proxy server. So if you have proxies set up to get to Internet servers in your corporation, then you'll be able to configure the Internet Explorer to allow that to occur as well. And so essentially for our viewers who might not understand proxy, if I were a, a very tight controlling corporation, I only wanted people to get out to serious places, <laughs> I could set up a firewall that allowed Absolutely. Uh, it's sort of a, an alias address. And that's right. Sense. Great. Yeah. Super. Okay. Well, we've got one, and I hear that the two of you may actually double team on, on this one. <laughs> uh, Mike Simpson, uh, thanks for calling us. Mike's out in Chicago, Illinois. Um, how compatible are Windows 95 and Windows NT? Can they run in a dual boot situation? And if so, what applets or programs for Windows 95 can also be used or leveraged into the Windows NT setup? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, to answer the first part, can you have Windows 95 and Windows NT on the same system? Yes, you can. Uh, what you have to do is, as you probably know, when you boot your machine and you have NT on it, it boots into NT. But you do have an option to choose either NT or DOS. To install Windows 95, you need to choose DOS. Windows 95 will also only install on a FAT partition. So any NTFS or HPFS partitions you might have, you're not going to be able to access while you're inside Windows 95. Um, as far as applications working between the two, since Windows 95 is a 32-bit um, operating system, a lot of applications will work in, in both versions. Uh, there are some issues with certain applications that require certain security services from NT, for example. Mm -hmm. And there are issues with MS-DOS applications and Windows 95 applications right. that require access to the disk as well, mm -hmm. kinds right. of things which would violate, win violate Windows NT security. Right. 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 Uh, maybe I, I'm to try to think of, I'm sure Mike's not alone in this. There are lots of uh, the kind of technical IS professionals that are our viewers here live and on videotape. Where would they go to get additional information? about this. In other words, you know, where would you send Mike if he hadn't gotten through to us and gotten on live today? Uh, what are the kinds of resources where he could find out information such as this? Well, one place I would go is I'd head down to the local bookstore and get the Introducing Windows 95 book. The which one by Adrian. It, right. Well, uh, that one too, the uh -huh. uh, Introducing Windows 95 by MS Press and the uh, Inside Windows 95 okay. by Adrian King. Both are excellent books for getting a uh, so, you know, the Introducing Windows 95 is a, is a light overview, and Adrian King really dives down a lot deeper. Uh, I'd also try and get a copy of TechNet or the mm -hmm. Resource Kit. Mm -hmm. um, or you could call us if you have any questions that you want to ask, you know, mm -hmm. a real-life person. And, and, is, and the Resource Kit drills down to that level of detail? Sure, there? sure. There's hundreds and hundreds of articles outlining the details, you know, the steps that you'd have to go through to set something like this up. Okay. Uh, we've got a number of questions about Exchange. Who's going to handle uh, the first first one. Well, it depends uh, on the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Bill King in Glens Falls, New York. Will Exchange support different users on one computer? Who's going to okay. answer Mr. King? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take Mr. King's question. That's, that's an excellent question. And, and that's, a, that's a big uh, request from a lot of our users is to have multiple people using the same machine and access their mail uh, and to keep it all separate. Uh, you could do that with MS Mail that was available with workgroups. You could set that up, and there's articles in TechNet on how to do that. Uh, Windows 95 makes it a lot easier because I, I showed you profiles earlier. And what you can do with profiles is we could have, let's say, three profiles, me, Alec, and, and Elliot, uh, each one containing the, uh, the MS Mail uh, information service, but each one having separate personal address books and personal information stores. And that way, whenever we log into Windows 95, we can instruct Exchange which profile to use. So it comes up, and I have my mail messages. You log in, it'll come up, and you'll have your mail messages. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Reed gave us a phone call from Los Angeles. And Eric was uh, hearing everything we've talked about. He, he's kind of feeling like maybe he's going to need to go out and buy a brand new portable <laughs> PC, you know, one of those mega, mega machines that you lust yeah. after when you see him on the planes. Uh, does Windows 95 really require a brand new portable PC? No, absolutely not. Um, 
Windows 95 will run as well as Windows 3.1 does today on any machine which is a 386 DX processor with four megabytes of memory or better. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that when you install Windows 95 on your computer, you won't see any performance hit if you're doing the same kinds of things that you've always done. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, if you want to now start talking about using some new applications or other things, you might want to consider upgrading your memory. But there are plenty of portable computer users out there who are in that configuration, the 386DX with 4 megs of memory, and Windows 95's portable capabilities will give them extra added functionality, things that they can do. And uh, built-in compression, for instance, like drive space, will allow them to extend the life of their PC as well. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so Eric doesn't have to carry as much with him anymore because some can hang out back at the server and, and, and the like. That's correct, yes. yeah. 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 And I also think just from my, my own perspective, a lot of times people have asked me as a non-Microsoft person this question, and I, and I basically tell them that as functionality goes up, that inevitably people are going to go towards more powerful machines, mm -hmm, but that the, mm -hmm. the but the reality is, how do you try to leverage the existing technology? And I'm real excited about the compression that's in Plus because mm -hmm, I think that mm -hmm. will be a, a, a real nice way of expanding how much we can carry with right, us. Right. Yes. Um, well, we have a, a, another exchange question that came in, and this is um, we don't well it, the person didn't didn't leave their their name, but they want to know can a Windows for work groups machine be the fax server and Windows 95 machine send faxes through this queue? Ah, good question. I didn't really go into that in my demonstration, but basically with, with workgroup fax, if you have a machine with a fax modem you can share, you're not really sharing the fax modem, you're sharing a queue, actually a directory on your hard drive, but you can share that for other users on your, on your network. Uh, and that was available with Windows for Workgroups, and it's still available with Windows 95. The problem is they're not backwards compatible. Okay. I can't have a Windows 95 Exchange client and a uh, Workgroups machine sharing the fax or vice versa. So when it comes to faxing, it's got to be all Win95 or all Windows for Workgroups. How much control does the end user have over if I want to send it when rates are cheaper and things like uh, that? Oh, you, we have a lot of control. And, and I showed you one way, or actually the easiest way to send a fax to Windows 95, just going through the fax wizard. But there are a lot of different ways to send a fax. And when it comes to sending it, when you go into uh, control panel, mail and fax, you can customize the times that you want to send and if you want to use a credit card to, to dial the number and things like that. So you have a lot of control over that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking earlier about the new uh, Boeing 7-7 that's coming out. Yes. That's going to have the ability to fax from the sky. Right. So I'm imagining people are going to be logging in from Windows 95 from uh, location 20,000 feet above, <laughs> above, <laughs> above the air. Um, another exchange question that came in from Carl down in Baton Rouge. Wanted to know that when Carl creates an exchange profile, What's in the profile's file name and how is it stored? And is there any limit to the number of profiles that Carl can create? Okay, another good question. Uh, all, the, uh, all the profile information isn't stored as a file on your disk. It's actually stored in the registry. Uh, the only files that you would have would be your personal address book and your personal information store. Those files would reside uh, on your disk and you actually have uh, the ability to decide where you put them and the names you give them. Um, as far as how many you can have, uh, you're limited by disk space, so you could have a good number of profiles on a system. Mm -hmm. um, does Windows 95 include built-in scripting support for dial-up connections? Was a question that Margot mm -hmm. asked us. Mm -hmm. uh, Windows 95 actually at this point doesn't include built-in uh, uh, scripting support for dial-up connections. And we realize that this is something that we need to do because slip users require scripting support. So we're working on the scripting right now and um, it looks like we'll probably have it ready in time for Windows 95 to ship. We're just not sure how it's going to be packaged yet, whether or not it'll start, out, it'll come as part of the resource kit or perhaps as part of Microsoft Plus or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, let, let's, as we start to wind up, let's, let's leave our, our viewers questions <laughs> here for a moment. What's it been like as we, as we Come down. I, I would imagine life has been busy for you <laughs> as, as you're heading into the home stretch. Just stretch. a bit. I mean, for the last uh, year and a half, I've worked on Windows 95, and it's hard to believe that we're only 11 weeks away from the final, you know, mm -hmm. shipment of the product and having this thing finally fly out the door. Mm -hmm. It's been fun, though. Mm -hmm. And and in terms of you, you've been involved in doing a fair amount of training. Right. Uh, right. When you're training folks on Windows 95. 
Um, where, where, does, where does their focus seem to be? What are you finding that technical people are really focusing on? Is, is networking one of the, the big areas? For well, one of, one of the biggest areas uh, that, you know, when we teach this, there, there's so many, so many things that, that people like, the hardware profiles, the support for, for PC cards, the 32-bit support for PC cards, the, the new double space, people really like that. Um, uh, one of the biggest things that people really like is our protected mode uh, network client uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to be providing um, because it really gets you away from having to load real mode drivers and you know and it's a it, you know from what we've used of it it's it's pretty fast and, and very easy to configure mm -hmm. so people like the networking side people have been pretty impressed with with everything that that's been introduced with Windows 95. Yeah. The networking is marvelous because you can install multiple protocol stacks you can right. uh, you know run multiple adapters and Windows 95 just doesn't care it makes it all work transparently. Right mm -hmm. including TCP IP in the box the support for DHCP uh, you know, all those options which make it so much easier to, to support everything out on your network. Now, you're not just saying this because you're Microsoft. <laughs> you're, you're, you both seem really excited about, about the product. Well, I, I live and breathe this. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, I use multiple network clients and multiple protocol stacks on my PC every day because mm -hmm. I have to. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Exactly. Like I said earlier, I've gotten more use out of my portable now that it supports. I don't have to worry about a config sys and auto exec real mode drivers. You know, most of the support is there, protected mode, 32-bit. It's a lot faster. I can be a lot more productive. Great. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and your excitement and your commitment to the product is real clear. That's all the time that we have for questions today. Our question and answer line is now closing. I want to thank Alec and Ben for sharing their knowledge and insights with us today. I've been using Windows 95 for quite some time now. The learning curve has been rapid as I've explored and used the new features and technologies embodied in Windows 95. You are now embarked on a similar learning process. Remember, Windows 95 will be the largest technology change in the history of computing. You, as an IS professional, are the key to making the shift to Windows 95 a success. Your early knowledge of this product provides your organization with a valuable asset. Today, we learn how Windows 95 makes portable users more productive, as it makes it less expensive and less time consuming to support. With the increase of mobile computer users, it is inevitable that corporations will have to refocus some of their support efforts to increase their ability to service their users. Windows 95 is the operating system designed to increase mobile computing capabilities while decreasing the support burden. We love to hear your feedback about this TrainCast series. Please send your comments to mstv at microsoft.com. You can also call 1-800-597 3200 for further information. And please, if you receive the fax back form, send it in as soon as you can. I'm also really interested in your feedback, and you can reach me at 1 800 95 Maisie. Our next show in the series will continue our in depth look at Windows 95. Michael Dunn is here today to give us a preview of Traincast number seven Systems Administration in Windows 95. Mike? Hi, I'm Michael Dunn with Microsoft Worldwide Training. Would you like to administer Windows 95 servers from a single location? Would you like to control a user's desktop without requiring the Windows installations be located on a central server? These are some of the topics I'll be covering in the TrainCast session, Windows 95 System Administration. For example, let's look at the Windows 95 System Policies feature. I'm logged into this machine right now with my normal username and password. I can run regedit. I can also go look at Device Manager. I can also look at my network setup. These are all things you might want a power user to be able to do at your site. Would you want every user to be able to do this, though? Probably not. With the Windows 95 system policy, I can restrict group, user, and machine options from a central system. You might think of it as a site policy. Let's see it in action. I'll log in as a different user now.
And now there's been some restrictions placed on this user. I can no longer run regedit, it's been disabled. I can't run device manager. The property sheet's been disabled entirely, it's no longer on the screen. And I cannot look at my network setup. During the system administration session, we'll discuss how to implement system policies at a Windows NT or Novell Network site and how you can create your own customized system policies. During the Windows 95 system administration session, we'll also discuss some other S words like SNMP, server based setup, scripted or batch installs, and SMS integration for making Windows 95 administration easier. We'll do this building on the other sessions you have already seen, such as Microsoft Network, Network Networks, and Windows 95 Setup. Now I know some sites are already migrating from Windows 3.1 with the WPP program and beta programs. In making these roll rollouts easier, they have been using setup script files to automate the setup similar to Windows 3.11 setup SHH file. In Windows 95, we try to go one step farther and offer tools to create the setup scripts. Here's a script I've created earlier and we used here to start the, an upgrade from within Windows 95 to the latest build of the product. Notice here I've got the setup exe, some command line parameters, and here's my batch file. Windows will not ever need to prompt me during the three main phases of setup. Let's watch as setup automatically runs through phase one or the gathering phase. Well, I hope you tune in and see what Windows 95 can offer in administration improvements and saving you time and money supporting Windows 95 systems. Thanks, Mike. We are looking forward to your show. Thanks again for joining us. We're happy to be your source for up-to-the-minute information about Windows 95. Good day from the Microsoft Studios in Redmond, Washington. To receive ongoing information, resources, and tips on training and support strategies for Windows 95, contact this address via email. For information regarding the Managing Windows 95 Learning Kit, or to contact Elliot directly, call 1-800-95-MAZY or send email to this address. If you'd like to subscribe to Microsoft's Win News electronic newsletter, send internet email to enews at microsoft.nwnet.com with the words subscribe Win News as the only text in the body of your message. Win News file sections can also be found on most major online services.
There are a number of electronic distribution points that contain information directly from Microsoft about Windows 95. Use the following electronic addresses for new white papers, press releases, and other documentation. The transcript, content outline, and PowerPoint slides of this broadcast will be available on CompuServe and the World Wide Web at these addresses. To receive the Microsoft Project Template for deployment of Windows 95, Send your name, company name, address, phone, and fax numbers via the internet to deploy95 at microsoft.com. The Microsoft Project Template is also available on CompuServe, Go MSTV Forum, Windows 95 Library. The title is win95p.zip. To receive a beta version of the Windows 95 Resource Kit, or for more information about this kit, call 1-800-315-0676. Inside Windows 95 by Adrian King is available for $24.95 at most major bookstores or by calling 1-800-MS-PRESS. To get a program guide for Microsoft TV with information on business-to-business -business television programs from Microsoft, email us at mstv at microsoft.com or call 1-800-597-3200. For information or to subscribe to Microsoft's TechNet program, call toll-free 1-800-344-2121 or visit your local software reseller. For international availability and pricing, check with your local Microsoft subsidiary. You can also view a subset of TechNet on the World Wide Web at this address. Watch for TechNet on the Microsoft Network, coming soon to a PC near you. To order a videotape of today's program, or any others in the Windows 95 Traincast series, call 1-800-597-3200. We're always anxious to hear your comments on the Windows 95 Traincast series, as well as other programs offered by Microsoft TV. Please contact us via the internet at mstv at microsoft.com or call us toll free at 1-800-597-3200. Thanks for being with us. And join us again on Microsoft's Windows 95 Traincast program when we'll go in-depth on system administration with Windows 95.